Five. Give this Hi, everyone. Uh, um, on behalf of the uh, Steering Committee in Latin American and Caribbean Studies at WPI, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, everyone to this Global School virtual event on Latin America and the Caribbean with a focus on sustainability. My name is John Galante. I am a historian of Latin America, and I'm also, uh, I also teach in the International and Global Studies Program uh, in the Humanities and Arts Department at, uh, at WPI. So this event uh, comes at a great time. It comes precisely when uh, we're launching a minor uh, in Latin American Caribbean studies here at WPI. We're implementing a number of grant funded programs uh, and initiatives in faculty research, uh, in new institutional partnerships, uh, engagements with uh, the community in Worcester and, and beyond. So it's uh, very exciting to welcome you all uh, here today uh, for this event. We have a very, very full agenda. Uh, over the next uh, roughly three hours. Um, we'll start with uh, the Provost Wolo Sobiejo and Paul Matheson who are going to introduce uh, WPI's new sustainability plan uh, and also introduce our plenary speaker, Carlos Nobri. Um, Carlos's talk will be followed by a round table discussion of directors of project centers uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, a number of faculty members uh, at WPI uh, sitting on that round table. That will happen around um, 2.30 or so, uh, just so you're aware of kind of the schedule if, if folks have to kind of come in and out. Our final session of the day is going to be a panel discussion uh, with a number of distinguished alumni from WPI who work and are from uh, Latin America and the Caribbean and are going to address issues related to COVID-19 crisis in the region and particularly its impacts on the economy and even um, some social issues as well uh, related to the economic effects of the COVID crisis uh, in the region. So please uh, hang around for that uh, panel as well. That should be happening around 3.20 uh, p.m. or so. We have a couple other really nice things uh, happening throughout the afternoon, some student testimonials from their work at project centers in the region, as well as some highlighting, highlighting some faculty research as well. Uh, one sort of logistical thing is that we will have the chat, the Zoom chat, uh, sort of um, moving throughout uh, the session this afternoon. So if you do have questions or comments uh, in relation to any of anything that you're hearing today, any of the different speakers or panels or participants, uh, please um, do uh, note those uh, questions in the chat 
uh, so we can, um, you know, sort of bring them into our, uh, our discussions as well. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn over sort of the virtual dais uh, to Wole Sobayejo, uh, the provost who's going to provide an introduction uh, for the first part of our session today. Thank you very much, John. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining in on this uh, celebration of sustainability and WPI collaborations in Latin America and the Caribbean. Next, please. So for me, it's really a special pleasure to welcome all of you to the third of the virtual events on uh, issues related to our global school. Uh, this third event will focus on Latin America and the Caribbean uh, with a special emphasis on the theme of sustainability. And as you know, our goal in our global school effort is to bring together all the key stakeholders, partners, alumni, students, faculty, and staff with interest in our global programs across the world. This particular month, we're focusing on Latin America and the Caribbean, but generally as an institution, our strategy is to use science, technology, and innovation to address global grand challenge problems um, and to and today we'll be focusing on issues related to climate change and the environment, and really what we can do about this in our research, in our education, in our outreach. And we wanna also use this as an opportunity to highlight WPI's sustainability plan for the next few years. Next. So as you look at this, um, you see that WPI as an institution has chosen the theme of sustainability as a foundational approach, foundational core value principle for the university. And uh, today we'll have Jeff Solomon, our chief financial officer, and Paul Matheson, the director of sustainability, unveil for us the next phase of our sustainability initiatives here at WPI. We'll also be presenting sessions organized by our faculty, staff, and students with foci on sustainability and connections to COVID-19 and really looking at Latin America and the Caribbean as areas of the world in which we have deep interests. And it's a special pleasure for me also to welcome Carlos Nobre, uh, who is our keynote speaker for today, uh, to talk to us about his amazing work uh, in the Amazon. Next. So I, I sort of um, would like to show you these beautiful, beautiful pictures of the Amazon, just to kind of uh, share with you one of the environmental gems of the world. And of course, there's so many parts of our climate system, our ecosystem that depend on the richness and the natural pristine state of the Amazon which of course has been decimated by human activities in the past few decades. And, and so the question that I'd like to tee up with showing you this image is how does this impact how we as a scientific technological community engage research, not only research that can impact our students, but research that could be part of a global effort to contribute to the solutions. And of course, there are many amazing scientists doing climate science, earth science work. But maybe we also need to think about how we do engineering in the world of the future in a way that might help us to preserve the beauty of the Amazon and many spaces like this across the world. And so I, I use this as a way of motivating some of what I'm gonna show you, which is partly personal and partly institutional. Next, please. So within this context, you know, we at WPI, of course, have more than 50 plus project centers across the world, many in Latin America and some in the Caribbean. And it's interesting to kind of see what the themes are that we focus on. So one of the areas in the area, especially of energy research, is the work of Mike Timko, who looks at sustainable fuels in collaboration with partners in Brazil. And I'm gonna also introduce you to some work that we've been doing in my research group on sustainable buildings, again, in collaboration with partners in Brazil and Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. And what I found in the last 20 years of these collaborations is just tremendous, tremendous opportunity for synergy in ways that really lead to 
solutions that are truly amazing. And so as we look at our 50 odd uh, project centers, I think these collaborations in Latin America and the Caribbean give us some excitement for really how we can be part of the solution to some of these challenging problems. Next. So I take here the work of my Timco and the energy group here at WPI. What we're really looking at is developing the next generation of sustainable fuels and renewable energy of the future. Mike is working with groups in Brazil uh, to develop new kinds of uh, renewable fuels that can go into different kinds of systems. There's also significant work going on in solar energy and the batteries of tomorrow and the recycling <laughs> within the framework of a circular economy. And so this work is going on with people like Pratap Rao and also folks like Yan Wang and others collaborating with people in a way that's really focused on really sustainable fuels that reduce CO2 emissions to the environment. Next. And as we think about this, again, our focus is on collaborations, this case, uh, between Mike Timko's group and the group in Brazil at UNICAMP. And this has been a very fruitful collaboration and one that we're hoping to grow in the future. Next, please. And as we look at this, we're looking at how do you go from raw materials and waste to the energy solutions of tomorrow in ways that really think carefully about the systemic impacts driven by science, driven by technology, but ultimately thinking about the environment as we explore these alternatives. Next. And we're looking at uh, kind of this systemic input of feedstock in waste materials and barley bagasse, uh, all the way through to the outputs, driven again by science to really develop the technologies that could enable the sustainable fuels of the future. Next. So, in that case, you can see clearly that we here in the US have a lot to benefit from the collaborations with the Brazilians. And in my own case, I have to say that in my travels about 20 years ago, I met a fellow by the name of Cosro Gavani, who is a well-known person in Brazil who is highly interested in natural materials such as bamboo. I also have met in my time others from Brazil in Homer Savastano at the University of Sao Paulo in Prasununga, with whom I have collaborated with, with whom I've collaborated over the last 20 years. Kozro really inspired us to work on natural materials and bamboo as a grass is a natural material with remarkable properties. And I had the pleasure of going to collaborate with him in, um, in Rio de Janeiro, just as I've worked with um, Homa Savastano at the University of Sao Paulo and Maria Jacen in Guadeloupe. Um, now, what's interesting is not only were these great places to visit, is that actually they inspired me to think differently. Next, please. And, and so we started to really look at the plants as sources of natural fibers and ways of integrating these natural materials into the construction and development of sustainable materials. Next. And as you begin to do this, you realize that you can develop novel composites inspired by the same mechanics you use to develop aerospace materials that have significant robustness and are eco-friendly. Next, please. And as you do this, you also begin to realize that you can find new value in different materials. And so we actually found that we could develop mushroom composites using fungi to construct on scaffolds, materials that are incredibly robust, that enable us to explore alternatives for the next generation of natural building materials, but also materials for different functions. And as we do this kind of work, what you begin to realize is that there is a lot more available to us for the materials of the future than materials such as cement that cause significant amount of pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. Next. And so this work, of course, also led us to work with Kozro Gavami, who was crazy about bamboo, to begin to look at the structure of the bamboo and how that contributes to the strength and stiffness and remarkable 
blend of properties that you get from bamboo. And those of you that know Nima Raba, Nima did his PhD at Princeton before coming here to WPI, working on some of these areas in ways that enabled us to do some interesting bio-inspired design of novel composites. Next. And as you go beyond that, you start studying the structure of bamboo at the nanoscale, and you realize just how many of the properties you get are derived from the organization of these structures in ways that inspire the next generation of composites for multifunctional applications. Next, please. And, and so thinking about this, I thought, well, this is interesting science, but I tell you what's come out of this has been a lot more. Students in my research group developed a bamboo bicycle company, bamboo bicycle, bull bicycles, that now makes and distributes these across the world. This is the most successful bamboo company in the world. Each of these bicycles sells for $5,000 to $8,000. And what inspires people to pay that much is the use of bamboo as a sustainable materials. Others have developed bamboo wind turbines. And it's interesting, we've also played with bamboo power generation systems and bamboo people movers. And, and in the case of the Brazilians, they've gone from making bamboo airplanes to what is now the third biggest aerospace company in the world, which is Embraer. And so what you realize is that these kinds of natural materials give us a great opportunity to innovate in ways that begin to generate alternatives. The bamboo wind turbine, by the way, is used at the University of Vermont as a supplement to solar power for their street lighting. And this is just only the beginning of a new era that I think will see more and more exciting applications of natural materials, such as bamboo. Next. And in doing this, we've been inspired to think well beyond just the studies of structure and modeling these to really creating aesthetically appealing structures with multifunctional capabilities. I show the image on the right there that seems like a palm tree. It's actually a communications tower with embedded electronics that's embedded with nature. And I think this just gives us a small glimpse of a future in which natural materials could play a role in ways that could also be designed with sustainable ecosystems. Next. And as we think about this, I'd like to just motivate us to think about a world in which materials such as these natural materials grown in sustainable ways could be the basis for the development of sustainable infrastructure with careful thinking about the carbon, di carbon dioxide emissions and some of the environmental impacts built around this. The tower on your left is the tallest current tower from bamboo structures in Shanghai, China. The tower to your right is the next vision of the next structure, again, showing what you can do with natural materials that are eco-friendly. Next. So thinking then about what does this mean for us? So WPI, of course, is a school with a focus on STEM, with a love of global. And we're excited about what we can do with that combination, working as interdisciplinary teams with people from humanities and arts, social sciences and policy, working together with scientists and artists and engineers to think about solutions to global grand challenge problems. In the first two uh, lectures of this series, we had first Robert Langer talk about biomedical grand challenges uh, in October. And then just last month, we had the ambassador from Ghana to the United States, Bafo Ajay Bawa, come to talk about African Grand Challenge development issues and how we at WPI can partner with Ghana to develop these kind of solutions to these problems. And, and today, it's a special pleasure to welcome Carlos Nobre to WPI. And Carlos and I met when I served on the UN Secretary General's Scientific Advisory Board. And Carlos will be talking to us about his amazing work in the Amazon and its potential implications for climate change. And I will, of course, be introducing him later. This, of course, is part of a series in which we, the WPI community, will be engaged in the world uh, each month at a time. In the, in the coming months, we'll be looking at Middle East, Asia, Oceania, Europe, and the future of work and the worker at the end of this academic year. And in the following year, we'll be starting with a focus on global local. 
as we do this, we hope that all our stakeholders here at WPI, from our alums to our partners, to our faculty, staff, and students, we really use this as an opportunity to get to see the different parts of the world and really see how we as a community can connect to sustainability and other grand challenge issues. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to uh, Jeff Solomon and Paul Matheson to talk a little bit about the WPI uh, sustainability plan. Jeff and Paul, over to you. Great. Thank you, Wally, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as co-chair with Wally of our sustainability initiative, we're very pleased to roll out today our new sustainability plan. Building off the great success of our initial sustainability plan, Professor Matheson, our director of sustainability, engaged our entire community over the past year in developing the goals and objectives of this next plan. Paul's now going to present our new sustainability plan and describe what we are calling our sustainability ecosystem. We're very proud of the work that's been done and look forward to great success in moving our sustainability initiatives forward. Paul. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and thank you to uh, both uh, Jeff and Wally for your leadership um, and your um, support and enthusiasm for sustainability. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking to you about uh, our sustainability plan. If you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, our current sustainability plan was completed in 2014. Uh, this was a, a five-year plan. And as you can imagine, the time for an update to this plan has arrived. Um, so. That's what prompted us to develop a new sustainability plan. Um, we've worked on this over the last uh, year or so and um, incorporated the inputs from a, a, in a variety of ways from the campus community, um, including four working groups who worked uh, diligently in coming up with goals and objectives for the plan. Um, so this plan is intended to guide our activities for the next uh, five years. It includes uh, goals, uh, objectives, and tasks in four areas. If we can go to the next slide, please. These areas include academics, operations and facilities, research, scholarship and innovation, and community engagement. I'm gonna spend just a few minutes uh, talking about uh, each of these areas. If we can just click to the next slide. Great, thank you. Um, so for academics, our, our goal really is to have, and our objective is really to have students uh, have the awareness, the ability, and the motivation to integrate sustainability into the academic programs, the courses and the projects. This range from building on their major and then bring it to a, um, as part of their mission as well. In addition, we really want to have our students provide, have an impact. We want students to have an impact on sustainability in a way that will have a true, meaningful, and positive impact on communities you know, here at WPI and beyond the WPI campus with local to global reach. Next slide, please. Now, we also want to have uh, the principles of sustainability guide our operations as well as our academic programs. Um, and so our considerations for that really include trying to reduce our environmental impacts by reducing waste, uh, reducing the use of energy and water and other resources that can impact the environment. Um, and then also creating or developing creative approaches and to incentivize and promote efficiency um, and resource reduction throughout the community. We also really want to have a, a healthy and a, and a welcoming campus. So we'd like to work with our facilities to support the promotion of a healthy campus environment We'd like to ensure a safe, healthy campus um, that's a, with well-being, that promotes diversity, equity, and inclusion, and provides sustainable alternatives um, such as transportation, dining, and food source alternatives as well, and naturally supports our academic and research programs. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we'd like to support this with our research and advanced sustainability in our research as well. Um, so we'd like to provide valuable contributions to sustainability, really that promote and incorporate a range of disciplines. And that's really what our role in terms of the uh, system, my office of sustainability is trying to support these efforts and to advance these efforts um, in the research area, in, in all different areas. Okay, there's, and we recognize that there's really a, sustainability is broad, requires a lot of different integrated approaches to address the breadth of sustainability. So we are also incorporating uh, cooperative approaches to manage sustainability, whether it be the circular economy, life cycles, or developing uh, development engineering as another approaches as well, really to help provide leadership and scholarship and innovation as a, a, a real leadership in sustainability. Um, next slide. Now, for 
all these different areas, we really need to have our community and our, um, our WPI community engaged in the, these efforts. Um, so we would like to have a culture of sustainability in which all of our members are engaged in these activities that advance sustainability, in which WPI recognizes these sustainability and the impacts across our organizational community and uh, academic activities. This would expand going beyond WPI as well. We want to really have an impact. We want to engage with communities beyond the campus to meet their sustainability needs. We want to provide effective dissemination, project engagement, and, and partnering to meet these goals. Okay, so, um, so you can see the breadth of what's involved. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, this is um, leads us, if we think about how this comes together, we like to think of it fondly as our sustainability ecosystem. And I'm just going to step through this slide for just a couple of minutes to give you a, a little bit of an idea where we want to go with this. First thing, if you start off at the bottom, the three major pillars of sustainability include economic security, environmental stewardship, and social, social justice. You know, we view these as core values that get integrated through our programs and through our departments um, and, um, and through all of our activities. Um, we recognize the breadth of these areas. Our sustainability goals are set up really to try to support these three areas and try to advance sustainability in all three areas. We've incorporated two major uh, um, initiatives in association with this. One of the, we're both looking at the local level as well as the global level, I guess you'd say. At the local level, um, we're considering local impact and we wanna think about our WPI campus as a living and learning laboratory to advance sustainability. Um, there are, we really want students and our entire campus community to be engaged in the uh, on-campus sustainability. We wanna have a healthy, a lifestyle and a sustainable living as part of our uh, part of our activities and lifestyle and our learning efforts as we move forward. Um, so this expands to both our local community as well. We envision WPI's like a sustainability hub for the hub for the local area, in which we incorporate or integrate with the community throughout the Worcester area and the Massachusetts or the local regional area as well. If we go now globally, we recognize that there's tremendous issues related to uh, the grand cha global challenges. There's so many needs out there. We really envision our campus, or our programs providing a, a notable impact on these things through our projects programs, and also through the development of the global, global school in particular, and these initiatives that you're seeing here today. Um, so a key thing is really from a sustainability perspective is supporting these initiatives, trying to help move these forwards and, and really think about how we can work together to expand these initiatives through partnerships. If you look at these local and global perspectives on it, um, they really come together in ways through our departments and our programs, but also through cross-disciplinary and systems types of approaches that we work with this. WPI, we envision ourselves, we recognize that we're so collaborative. We work together from different disciplines. Uh, there's a lot of cross-disciplinary initiatives going on, um, trying to have a systems view of it, which is so important to try to think about managing these major issues that we look at in the world. Okay, so. Uh, next slide, please. As we move forward, um, we our goals initially were certainly are to advance our sustainability plan um, and advance sustainability through by following the sustainability plan, starting off with baseline and trying to measure, think about how we expand things as we look forward to the other to look forward. In addition to that, we really want to develop our this concept of the initial or the living and learning laboratory. Um, we want to support projects locally, um, support research on campus get our students engaged um, here, both on campus, locally, and really build on these local and regional projects through our project centers and through our research on that we see here on campus. We'd like to extend this to think about how it relates to these global initiatives. Um, so therefore, in a sense, we're working to support our, this global school and the exciting opportunities that are being developed. If we look at through the Latin America and the Caribbean and, and some of these exciting initiatives that we're looking at, um, whether it be from looking at the uh, the Amazon and the rainforest and trying to manage those as well as looking forward to, you know, all these other initiatives that Wally talked about in terms of both energy and buildings. There's so many opportunities, so many needs that we can build on. So we really want to both link our local and our global efforts. Clearly this one involves partnerships, collaborations, and, um, and really engaging both here on campus and off. Um, as you look forward to today's sessions here, I think there are many um, opportunities to think about sustainability and how we can partner I'm really excited about the exciting program. So I, I feel like by looking forward and moving forward through sustainability, we'll really have a sustainable impact. And I think it's very excited about it. I appreciate the opportunity. I'll turn it back to Wally. I'm looking forward to Dr. Nobe's presentation. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Paul. And thank you, Jeff, 
for introducing our next phase of our sustainability plan. And thanks for really driving these initiatives forward. I'm delighted to be with you on that team. And so with that, I'd like to now turn to introducing our keynote speaker for today, uh, Carlos Nobre. Um, Carlos is the co-author of the fourth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for which he received in the team the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. Um, he was born in Brazil and studied first electrical engineering at the Aeronautical Institute of Technology, received a bachelor's degree in 1974 from AIT in Brazil. He then went to MIT where he studied uh, climate science uh, and received a PhD in 1983. During this period, he started his work with Jules Charney and Jadish Shukla in constructing climate models. Uh, following that experience, he returned to Brazil, first as a scientist at IMPA, and then later he started to visit the University of Maryland, where he started his work on the impacts of deforestation on climate, and started to think about the implications of deforestation for the Amazon, which he projected could eventually become a savanna if, current, if those activities go unchecked. Carlos is known for his work on biosphere-atmosphere interactions and his leadership of large teams that have really conducted very significant science projects in the Amazon. Um, and he's also somebody that I know is committed to, to sharing this vision with the world, um, having worked with him a little bit as uh, both members of the Scientific Advisory Board of the UN Secretary General. So it's really a special pleasure for me to welcome Carlos Nobre to present um, his talk here today at WPI. Carlos. Thank you very much, Wally, and uh, everyone else. I really enjoy very much the introductions, and I'm very excited. Uh, I try to share my screen. I need someone to authorize that. Okay. Rachel. Um, it's very interesting to see uh, how WPI evolved the concept of uh, sustainability ecosystem. And then in my presentation, we're going to see that there is a lot of uh, uh, similarity. Let me see if I can. Okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Amazon. And uh, you see here a picture with rainbow and then disturbed with forests. And uh, so uh, basically, I'm going to, to talk about uh, how close the Amazon is of a tipping point of disappearing most of the forest, but also, and I was very impressed to see your initial presentations, the potential of creating a sustainability ecosystem in the Amazon. And I termed Amazon Green Deal. I hope you like the term and you can use the term. Uh, so I will first, uh, tell a little bit uh, how important the Amazon is, then what's going on, deforestation fires, how close we are from the tipping point, and then uh, about 50% of my talk will be seeking uh, innovative sustainable pathway, what we call Amazon Third Way or Amazonia 4.0, and I, you're going to see how close those concepts are from your concepts of sustainability ecosystem, how to, to create one. And at the outset, let me say, I will love to partner with you. 
to partner with your program on creating sustainability ecosystem across the world. Until perhaps two decades ago, the Amazon was seen as a, as a green hell uh, in popular culture, books, films. But in fact, I mean, for the people that are living there for 12,000 years, the indigenous peoples, uh, they always saw the Amazon as a green paradise. And they survived the well-being came from the forest, from the standing forest. But let's look from our scientific uh, eyes of today, the Amazon as a regional entity of the Earth system. It's a key player in global carbon cycle, 120 billion tons of carbon stored there. Uh, the most powerful hydrology, the Amazon River, about 15% of the freshwater input into the oceans. The, the richest place for biodiversity in the planet. Also important for climate stabilization, water recycling. It's a very important heat source for tropical uh, circulations. Least but not last, uh, helps maintain cultural and ethnic diversity. Over 400 indigenous groups, over 300 uh, different uh, languages. It only loses to Indonesia that has about 1,000 indigenous groups. So in fact, I mean, the modern science agrees with the, the assessment that indigenous people do is a green paradise. It's a green paradise for the planet Earth. For instance, uh, it removes between one and two billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year. But also, and this is something very important to remark, because of course the ecosystem services to the global climate of storing carbon, needless to say how important that is, but very few people really realize the importance of species diversity. One hectare, one football pitch of Amazon forest has more angiosperm trees with flowered species than all of Europe, all of Europe. And very few people realize how important that is. It's, one might say it's a kind of a, a symbolically speaking, a biological heart of Earth. Also plays a very important non-carbon ecosystems services. Uh, let me just go uh, briefly here. Uh, you can see here the, the arrow. Uh, you know, if you compare to the US when you have also the, the winds coming from, you know, entering the Gulf Coast and then, but you see much less rain when you get close to the mountains. And then the Amazon is the opposite. You get much more rain when you get close to the Andes. So what happens is that the moisture flows comes carried by the trade winds from the Atlantic, enters the Amazon, and every molecule of water vapor recycles seven, eight times. So falls down, rainfall, the roots trap the water, bring the water to the, to the leaves, transpiration, and that's a recycling more rain forms, more, more, and then you have a maximum rainfall here. And uh, also the, the moisture flow feeds the Andes, the snow and the rainfall in the Andes, and also feeds the rainfall here in southeastern South America, Uruguay, Paraguay, southern Brazil, parts of Argentina. 18% of the rains here comes from the Amazon. So this is unique, unique, unique system doing that. And then a conclusion from decades of research is probably what the indigenous people uh, intuitively knew for thousands of years. The Amazon forest only exists because the forest exists. This, those are key evolutionary accomplishments. Tens of millions of years, geological evolution, uh, biological, biodiverse evolution, uh, providing all sorts of environmental services which keep the forest standing. It's tremendously efficient recycling of water, as I mentioned, and it's very efficient recycling nutrients 
because keep in mind, this is tropics, 2.5 meters of rain a year, over tens of millions of years. So the soils are very poor, are leashed of nutrients. So the recycling of nutrients, all, most of the nutrients are in the forest. So that's a very efficient recycling. However, however, the, it's really surprise, perhaps not a surprise, but that in the 1970s, this is almost 400 years after the European colonizers landed in South America, in North America as well, still they could not see any value in the biodiversity. So the development model implemented in, in the Amazon since 1970s was one in which forests were seen as obstacle to development, quote unquote to development. And burned forests were very useful to produce fertilizers. And that's still the, the prevailing development model for the Amazon. So, and fire is a very critical element in, in that. You can see here 2016, fires in the tropics, still all over the tropics, fires are, are still very much a factor in the, uh, the forest as a fertilizer. So the ashes fertilize the soil, let's say for a pasture land for five, seven years, and then the soil become very poor, and then the cattle ran rancher moves on and new deforestation. So last year, for instance, there was a peak in fires, 2019, which were surpassed by 2020. So unfortunately, we are seeing uh, very uh, sad destruction of the Amazon. This is carbon monoxide, just to tell you the pollution problem. Carbon monoxide is a very serious pollutant for life in general, for human health as well. So this peak in August last year. And now I show you this deforestation uh, evolution from 1990s, 2016. So you can see here the forest loss by year. And uh, the areas in green are protected areas, indigenous territories and uh, conservation units. Uh, and I also, another one, it's a zoom in that area, you're going to see this huge increase in deforestation uh, in most areas, including affecting some protected areas. But uh, that's the, the dynamics of land use change in the Amazon for starting 1970s to today. And this is basically to produce commodities, mostly soy, that's exported to Europe, to Asia, and also meat, uh, bovine meat that's exported to other countries as well. So th those are the two drivers of land use change in the Amazon. And uh, uh, so that has going on for several decades. Well, of course, the main driver is an infrastructure aspect, which is road construction. 95% uh, of deforestation in Brazilian Amazon takes place within 5.5 kilometers of roads. Primary roads on the map, on the top here you see primary roads, but also secondary roads. So this is really a very clear element that the common infrastructure present in the Amazon in the last 50 years is leading to this devastation of the Amazon. Uh, and I, I want to show you how that happens. You see first on this satellite imagery uh, roads, and then you start seeing the tremendous increase in deforestation. Uh, primary roads, you see here a primary road here, and then a lot of secondary roads. This is one area of the Amazon, a second area, 1980s to uh, 2016, you see huge area, this is southwestern Brazilian Amazon, and uh, also uh, a third example here, uh, this very rectangular type of deforestation, those are 100 uh, hectare plots given to, to 
to migrants from other parts of Brazil and uh, led to tremendous uh, clear cutting of the forest. So basically, in 1990, uh, I, myself, and colleagues, we posed the savanization hypothesis, which is basically if we, this is the forest, this is 60 savanna, and if we the forest here, this southern Amazon would not become a post deforestation climate, it's a, a savanna and climate envelope here with long, long dry season. Here, dry season is very short, and the post deforestation dry season would be longer in southern Amazon. So, but that was 30 years ago. It was a kind of a, it seems to be a long distant projections. But basically what you're seeing a pattern of deforestation, look here in this southern, southwestern Amazon, highly deforestation also near the Andes, 17% of the Amazon forest has been deforested. And what really is taking place is a, is a synergistic combination, a kind of an evil combination uh, of large scale drivers and I, I'm going to, I, I'm showing here several tipping points uh, in the planet. And, and the Amazon civilization has been activated, this tipping point. I will briefly explain why. Uh, all these tipping points are interconnected. And let's start here with the melting of Greenland ice, uh, ice caps, and also the melting of the Arctic sea ice. So what happens when that melting fresh water here, they uh, interact with the thermal high line circulation. This is oceanic circulation, which sinks in the North Atlantic here and here, and then generates this thermal high line circulation that really transverses throughout the Atlantic, the Pacific, and then parts of that comes back as the Gulf Stream. So basically, because of the uh, slowing down of the thermal high line circulation, this area of the Atlantic is becoming warmer. That has a direct impact in the US, stronger hurricanes, as you were observing, more and more, like 2017, 2020. And also, warmer Atlantic, tropical North Atlantic, induces droughts, induces less rain here. So this is the larger scale. And then it synergistically adds to the regional deforestation and fires, which induces less rainfall, hotter and longer dry season. So this is the very bad combination of a large scale uh, change associated with, with global warming with a, a, a regional local scale change associated with deforestation and fires. Uh, I'm not going to, to, to tell you all the details, but uh, 30 years of studies in the Amazon have clearly shown that the, this, it seems to be a small difference here. Deeper rooting system, roots, dense rooting system near the surface, and some roots go to seven, seven, eight, ten 10 meters. Very different than the replacement grassland in pasture land, very shallow rooting system. Also, this is a smoother surface. This is a turbulent surface, rougher surface. So the air here, it becomes more turbulent. So it eases up the, 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 the mixing of quantities here, carbon dioxide, heat, water vapor with the the atmosphere. Here is the smoother surface, so this, this um, mixing effectiveness is less. So that's why it's warmer between 1 and 2.5 up to 3 degrees. It transpires much less water during the dry season because the root system does not access water. And here it keeps very high transpiration rates, in fact higher in the dry season, higher in the dry season. So uh, uh, primary productivity is higher in the dry season. This is very unique, very unique. A vegetation that uh, primary productivity is higher in the dry season. So the forest is functioning year-round. So it's cooler, 
So this is a much stronger water recycling, more rain. Here, much weaker water recycling, less rain. So this is uh, a diagram that we are seeing. And the fact is uh, that in fact, I mean, we are very close to this tipping point. We may ask how close to Amazon tipping point in which the, the whole Amazon forest will be forest keeping over Western Amazon, perhaps 30% and 60, 70% becoming a very degraded uh, tropical savanna with much less biodiversity and also losing a huge amount of carbon. So basically we are looking uh, many studies. I will show one that I produced. These four drivers of change, elevated CO2 concentrations, global warming, deforestation, one, one million square kilometers have been cleared, and increasing forest fires. And we did some calculations here, uh, a combined effect of these human drivers of change, high emission scenarios, IPCC high emissions, 20% deforestation, almost the level that we reached today, increased vulnerability to fires, and also the so-called positive effect, fertilization effect, which makes the, the Amazon forest removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This is the control experiment. This is what happens by 2050 if all these drivers act together. So we lose between 50 and 60% of the forest. If this continues to the end of the century, by 2070, we'll have only 20, 25% of the forest near the Andes. So this is a projection. However, we have to look at the observations and the, looking at the observations really where it comes our major concern. Uh, I will go through the observations that we are seeing unfolding before our eyes, extreme climate events, droughts and floods, and I will show you later a little bit of those results. Dry season in Southern Amazon is becoming longer, three to four weeks. Forests in Southern Amazon are showing reduced water recycling. Forests are removing less carbon dioxide. Mortality rates of wet climate, tree species increasing in most of the Amazon. And, and also we are observing a savanization fauna. Uh, species like the guara wolf uh, are moving to degraded areas of the forest. So we have had this much increasing extreme droughts like 2005, 2010, all related to this warming of the tropical North Atlantic. We are seeing the droughts, 2005, floods, record floods, 2009, droughts, 2010, another record flood in 2012, also 2014, another record drought, 2015, 16, and this year is another very strong drought. So we are seeing increase in the frequency. One strong drought will happen once every, uh, in the past, once every 20 years, related to El Nino, El Nino episodes in the Pacific. Now you're seeing two extreme droughts a decade. Uh, very concerned, very worrying is the duration of the, of the dry season. It's lengthening three to four weeks uh, over the last 40 years. And in particularly this diagram shows, uh, let's say this is the onset of the rainy season. Red is rainy season starting in October. S see that this is becoming more and more red, meaning the rainy season in the forest. This is deforestation. The forest areas is delaying four weeks compared to the 1980s. So Amazon is becoming an inferno in terms of uh, uh, forest fires. And also this diagram shows the reduction of deforestation. Here you see when Brazil did very well, this Brazilian Amazon, re re deforestation was 27,000 square kilometers. It came down to less than five, but forest fires, fires did not decrease at the same rate. The forest is becoming more vulnerable to fires. This uh, study uh, carried out by NASA show all this area that you're seeing here, Southern Amazon is becoming much weaker in recycling. It's not recycling uh, water vapor as efficient as it used to be. And very concerning is also, you see here, this is the amount of carbon dioxide the forest is removing every year, 19, 
90s and see declining, 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 declining. And there are some estimates that by 2030, the Amazon may turn into a carbon source. The forest, I'm not talking about emissions by, by fires and by deforestation, just the forest. And the, the, I think the most worrying uh, data that came in 2019, this study look at all these areas in red is where dry season is becoming longer, hotter, less rain. And they look at the species, mortality rate of species. And these red areas means wet taxa, uh, typical of Amazon climate, have a higher mortality rate than the ones in blue, which are areas in which the rainfall show increase. So this is really showing we are very close to the tipping point. And, uh, and also, as I mentioned, now we are starting to see uh, uh, fauna typical of the savannas starting to move into the graded areas of the Amazon. And this result from uh, the IPCC 6, if the planet warms up three degrees, look where this extreme hot and dry vents, look here, in the planet, all over the planet, the place where the, more, the highest frequency of hot and dry events, the same year, the same month, the same week, is tropical North America, mostly the Amazon. So the Amazon is under a great risk. That's why we made a lot of warnings. So we should not, should not exceed 20, 25% of total forest area because we are going to cross the tipping point and the observations are showing that. Uh, this is just an animation showing this, what would be this, this deforestation the savanization of large portions of the Amazon. On the right side here, just in a, uh, a closer view, what means forests will only remain too close to the river uh, edges. And, uh, you know, 60 up to 70% of the Amazon will turn into a degraded savanna. So can we avoid the Amazon tipping point? This is really uh, perhaps still within our hands. We have to really to pick. It is our, uh, our decision whether we go to a dystopic scenario, fragmentation, increasing deforestation, fires, or utopic, but, but feasible, which is the lower one, sustainability. Let's say how to create borrowing from uh, the RPI Ecosystem, uh, sustainability ecosystem, how we create. Is it possible a zero deforestation economic development model in the Amazon? So let's try to address that question, looking at the two land use models in the Amazon. First one, what, what we call first way, and in, emphasis on protecting the forest, uh, indigenous lands, conservation units, and the, the traditional some sectors like agribusiness sector, they say these are obstacles for economic development. But is that really the case? So this is the areas, a green protect areas, yellow uh, indigenous territories, 47% of the Amazon is legally protected, largest contiguous tropical forest on the planet. But the second way, as we call it, is the resource intensive development over the forest to produce commodities, meat, soy, mining, hydropower. Is it necessary to get, to get rid of the forest? So we see here uh, the increasing deforestation in Brazil and Amazon uh, between 1985 and 2019. So you see most of the Southern uh, Amazon has been cleared. 20% uh, of the Brazilian Amazon has been cleared, 800,000 square kilometers, deforestation is still going up. Two days ago, it was announced in 2019, 2020 figures, they are 11,000 square kilometers deforested. So we have to ask the question whether uh, we can increase, we, we may have the sustainable intensification, but this is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We have to think about a solution space, forest restoration and the uh, creating a standing force by economy. So that's the, what we are trying to promote. And you're going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of common elements from your 
ideas on sustainability ecosystems, using modern technologies, uh, natural products, making use of natural products. So basically, there is an urgent need of this great acceleration of disruptive solutions and your beautiful concept, sustainability ecosystem is a disruptive solution. So what's the potential of a biodiversity driven bioeconomy for all these industries, food, beverage, nutraceutical, uh, cosmetics, uh, industrial oils, and particularly genetic resource, perhaps the greatest potential. So Amazonia 4.0 is really a kind of a virtual cycle between the modern fourth industrial revolution innovations and harnessing the biological and biomimetic assets. So applying the 21st century paradigm of knowledge societies in the Amazon. So this new sustainable development to add value with innovation. Again, I just go back to what I show, this tremendous potential of the, the place with the largest species diversity. This is a study uh, carried out a few years ago showing the economic potential of 450 species in the Amazon. Let me compare uh, acai berry. I think most of you, particularly younger generations, know acai berry from the heart of the Amazon, and soy. So this is a study that showed the productivity, the economic value of acai berry per hectare per year is seven times that of soy in one Brazilian state, Pará state in the Amazon. This is well, you know, trusted data, official data by Brazilian government. This comparison of uh, cocoa with cattle, uh, this is a recent study that shows uh, co cocoa a thousand dollars on average uh, per hectare per year, and uh, uh, cattle 142. So this is again seven to one. So this just to give you a few uh, examples, uh, and this let me show you the official statistics by Bra Brazil Census Census Bureau, 2017 agro. Uh, uh, agricultural census 2017. Uh, meat and soy has uh, $183 per hectare per year, $4.4 billion that year, and acai berry, cocoa, and Brazil nuts, $1.6 billion, $3,300 per hectare per year. This is official data, just to give you an idea that the potential, economic potential, is much, much, much higher. And particularly, if we think of this huge deforest areas, 23% of the deforest areas in the Amazon have been abandoned by, by, by cattle, ranchers, and crops. And uh, uh, the potential of agroecological systems, and I will show you the, this uh, film that shows a little bit what that might be the potential. So you, the agroecological systems, you restore a major potential of the forest, uh, mature agroecological systems, they, they maintain about 60% of forest biodiversity and they store up to 80% of carbon. They may take several decades for a mature agroecological system, but that, that's just to, to give you a flavor of what the potential of restoring huge areas in the Amazon with agroecological systems and then making use of a huge number of products out of these systems. Let me give you a few illustrations of these bioeconomic assets, uh, terrestrial aquatic ecosystems. I will give you four examples. Uh, let me say first, all these things that are ready for markets. Uh, uh, fragrance, uh, sorry, this is in Portuguese. I forgot to, to pick the right slides, but fragrance for cosmetics, uh, and uh, uh, acai berry, uh, molecules coming from, from drugs, coming from uh, poison of snakes, $4,000 per gram, uh, and also molecules uh, specialized in biotechnology. Let me start with this 
one, which is a reality, the global emergence of acai berry. It was something very local in 1980s. Then today is a global, it's a merge, emergence in global markets for a very large number of products. So acai berry brings $1.2 billion to the Amazon economy. It's larger than uh, timber. It mostly, most timber comes from illegal logging. It has over 50 different products of acai industrialized outside of the Amazon and has a very large profitability per hectare. Specialized molecules, the rosewood, uh, terpene, and this is of course the famous fragrance, Chanel number no. five. Uh, this uh, enzyme coming from a uh, microbial in this lake, Lake Porake, uh, convert cellulose into sugar, increasing 50% of bioethanol production, just to give you the potential and a biomimetic potential is just to look at uh, the co-evolution of uh, pirarucu. This is one important fish from the Amazon, only exists in the Amazon, and piranhas. And this co-evolution resulted in the in these uh, elements in the skin uh, and uh, University of California, the biomimetics laboratory, looking at how the structure, and we are seeing Wally mentioning the structure of bamboo and how you understand how you can make very solid infrastructure for construction. And this uh, labs in Berkeley, San Diego, they look at that uh, and then they construct this vest, bulletproof vests, very inexpensive, very uh, productive. So this is uh, the potential. I'm just saying the potential which is known. So basically these pillars, you know, I, I call it standing forest flowing rivers by the verse driven by economy, but certainly I might use the term is a sustainability ecosystem, and the, which is harnessing these biological biomimetic assets, sustainably valuing traditional knowledge, has to be socially inclusive and just ecologically sound, equitable and fair sharing, a range of applications in many industries and restoring large fractions of the deforest areas. So let me show you one Film, two minute film that shows Amazonia 4.0 concepts.
So this is the concept, and let me finish the presentation in the next several minutes to how difficult it is to add value to biodiversity in the remote interior of the Amazon. So basically, we have to think of uh, uh, strongly based on local communities. Uh, there are, this is Brazilian Amazon, all over the Amazon, there are over 6,000 communities, villages, settlements, indigenous villages, cities, towns. So we have really to think of uh, using modern technologies to, to conceive not uh, everybody flowing uh, into big cities, but a decentralized model. So a systemic view, uh, we really have to use modern technologies to, to find solutions to all these uh, challenges, uh, isolation, infrastructure, green infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure, logistics, how to bring complex process, how to ensure quality and volume of production, how to access markets and be competitive and how to train uh, the, the teams there so in the hinterlands of the Amazon. So this is really our challenge in the Amazon 4.0 project. And I will briefly tell you uh, what we are doing now in two initiatives. One is it's called Amazon Creative Labs and the other one is Rainforest Business School. Amazon Creative Labs is a capacity development uh, infrastructure. Uh, basically, we are developing portable uh, moving labs that are like a small biofabrics for value chains. So we're going to community, we plan to go to communities and to, to do capacity development uh, in moder modernization of a value chain. And uh, also we want to interact the fusion of traditional and scientific knowledge, particularly a co-design and co-production of knowledge. I think very similar to some concepts I've seen when you explain the sustainability ecosystems. We are currently developing several of these uh, laboratories. One for Coco, Coco Asu is a very close relative at Teogroma Grande Forum. Uh, one for Brazil Nuts, one from Genomics, one from Gourmet Cooking Oils, and we are going to start one from Acai Berry. And uh, in particular, this one, we are finishing construction. We finished by February. Uh, this is uh, a biofabric of a production line of uh, chocolates, chocolates made of uh, cocoa and also of this other, uh, other uh, fruit. And the Amazon, it's called cupuasu, uh, which produces a beautiful, fantastically tasting chocolate. So this is a very modern with uh, solar energy, uh, drones uh, to transport uh, materials, 3D uh, modeling, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I will rush through, we are finishing that. Uh, and then we already have the four, first four communities which are going to receive the training in 2021. We got some funding already and we are going to move the, the lab to, to, to train these communities, this association of women producers of Kupuasu. And this is uh, Kilombo, this is former African slave communities, and also River Rhine community, and another River Rhine community, this is Tapajos River, another River Rhine community. And also we are going to do a first, uh, fifth training activity for students. We also want to go to campus and uh, run these laboratories. And uh, also, uh, we are developing, and uh, this course is already about to start in March at the Uni University of Sta State of Amazonas University in Manaus. So it's a, it's a new type of uh, rainforest of a business school, uh, uh, really with the eyes for the forest, how you, you develop sustainable uh, business for standing forests, so really an environment for environmental assessing the risks, environmental social risks, and how to develop and to capacitate students. Uh, it starts with MBA. So basically it wants to, to build a curriculum uh, with existing knowledge for this type of studies, but also innovate to create new uh, materials, textbooks, 
uh, it will be also online. And this is a forum, forum also to promote uh, uh, a debate on how to move towards this construction of the sustainability ecosystems, decentralized in many parts of the Amazon. So let me finish briefly uh, with some thoughts, looking ahead, what's the real advantage of a biodiversity rich countries, such as the Amazonian countries in the concert of nations. Uh, perhaps in the Amazonian countries, they have to, to turn the way they are thinking of development. We are becoming mostly disindustrialized nations, providers of commodities, mineral, uh, agricultural, food, uh, materials, uh, to industrialized nations. And, and value adding is done outside of the Amazonian countries. By and large, over 90% of value adding is done elsewhere in developed nations, industrialized nations. So basically, uh, so how can we emerge as global leaders by implementing a biodiversity-driven bioeconomy? So it's decentralized by industrialization, which provides also higher well-being, higher income, social justice uh, to develop forest products, process new knowledge, and to spearhead the development of this innovative 21st century tropical bioeconomy. Focus on health and conservation, so it's also important for planetary health, maintaining the forest standing in line with the global society, seeking sustainable solutions to environmental and health crisis. Uh, I was planning to, to show a few slides on risks of pandemics that I, I removed, uh, but of course, you know, perturbing the Amazon, there's tremendous risk of pandemics. So to turn Amazonian countries into environmental powers of social biodiversity. So this is what I call Amazon Green Deal. It's our vision of the sustainability ecosystems, how to, how to transform. So really, is it too much idealistic or is it realistic? I think it's a combination. It has it idealism, realism, and then we need huge amount of innovation. Basically, so how to, so this Amazon Green Deal is a nature-based solution to transform these Amazonian countries in environmental powers of social biodiversity, creating this novel circular bioeconomy, and also has to be circular, of standing forests and flowing rivers to create jobs, well-being, prosperity, protecting biodiversity, and combating climate change. It's ideal, but it, with modern technologies adding to traditional knowledge, we can really make that uh, possible as, as scientific and traditional knowledge as basis. So uh, tropical forest only exists because the forest exists. And uh, as the late famous geographer from Brazil, Berta Becker, to add value to the heart of the forest. And as Dave Copenhauer, indigenous leader, saving the heart of mother earth. So that's what we have in mind to bring these innovations to the heart of the Amazon, the Amazon, to keep the Amazon as the biological heart of our planet. Thank you, thank you very much. And I'm very glad to be able to, to give you these ideas. And the, really, I want to finish by saying, WPI, please welcome to help us with this project. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Carlos, for that fascinating and very timely talk. And thank you to all of you in the audience for joining us today. My name is Arthi Madan. I am part of the steering committee of Latin American and Caribbean Studies at WPI. And I'll be facilitating our question and answer right now. We have about 10 minutes. You are welcome to type your questions into the Q&A. Um, and we already have one. So I'll read the first question uh, from Kareem uh, Chichakli. It reads, I worked with Philip Fernside briefly about 10 years ago with the goal of reducing deforestation. He said the best we can do is to delay it, that the roads through the Amazon have been planned for a long time and will happen. And he pointed to the motto on the flag, order and progress. 
Is there anything we can do to stop or to reverse this? Yes, of course we can. I mean, of course, I mean, uh, let's say globally speaking, you know, 65% of, of uh, tropical deforestation all across the planet, South America, Central America, Africa, Southeast Asia is driven by cattle. So, you know, certainly, and of course, you know, excess, <laughs> excess of animal protein is very bad for our health. So the younger generations, we hope, they will shift diets. So this is very important for the planet, for the planet and for our health. But even you know, on a slow moving shifting of diets, uh, the productivity of cattle ranches in the Amazon is ridiculously low. The, the, it's more like you know, an excuse to keep pushing deforestation to land tenure the cultural value of land tenure, the cattle rancher is not concerned, most cattle ranchers are not concerned with productivity, with, with profits, with, with high technologies. No, they are concerned with sheer size. They want, you know, they are happy when they have one cattle ranch at minimum 10,000 football pitches, 10,000 hectares. So we have to change that culture. So we have to bring more modern uh, livestock farming. Uh, if that is done, so-called sustainable intensification, you, you, we can still produce meat in the Amazon, but use a much, much less area. We can reduce today uh, 60, 500,000 square kilometers of, of the Amazon are in these low productivity cattle ranches. So, that can be reduced by 50%, uh, 200, two, maximum 200,000 square kilometers in cattle ranches with higher double productivity. So that would really uh, meet demands, global demands for meat and still uh, really uh, clear, uh, free, huge areas for the develop, for restoration, for forest restoration, which is very important to, uh, to put us uh, with less risk of savannization, the tipping point, but also to produce this uh, productive and, and lucrative and valuable, economically valuable uh, bioeconomy with forest products uh, instead of meat and crops. Thank you for that. Our next question is from Alex de Crispigny. He says, what are your thoughts on how these new green initiatives will work with the current government? Are these contingent on government support? Uh, yes, I mean, of course we have many Amazonian countries. Uh, currently, the one country with, where, where the, the government, the federal government, the president has a clear a political speech towards a sustainability model is Colombia, President Ivan Duque. Uh, unfortunately, in Brazil, the, Brazil has 64% of the Amazon forests. Uh, still, the president, you know, people call it uh, tropical Trump. And uh, so, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you why, uh, but anyway, it's a, 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 a vision that you know, natural resources have to be exploited at maximum, uh, no recycling, no circular economy, uh, fossil fuel, all those elements. So, however, I mean, I think I, we are optimists in Brazil uh, because of you in the US, you know, the election of Joe Biden brought some optimism, first optimism. It seems that we, are, we have seen the peak of anti-science movement. It seems that we are going to see a slowdown, a decline, and the global anti-science anti movement that were growing like crazy in the last 10 years. Uh, we hope that will be the case. And that being that the case in Brazil, then science will easily point out the benefits of keeping the forest standing ecosystem services, much more uh, profitable economy. So eventually we are going to see, you know, this obstacle of uh, government with the uh, uh, old fashioned uh, vision 
uh, it, it will be uh, over. We hope, we hope it will be over. Ati, you're muted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Carlos. Our next question is from Angel Rivera. He asks, can indigenous tribes be incorporated into plans for economic development? He says he's thinking in terms of indigenous rights and decolonization processes that would help recover the Amazon. Absolutely, absolutely. And the indigenous people, uh, most indigenous people in Brazil and Amazon or in all of Amazon, they are well nourished when they are living under their traditional lifestyle. So they are well nourished. So therefore they have no problems of uh, uh, malnourishing and uh, in, in brain development when they are a, 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 a child. So they are very, very intelligent people, very intelligent. So uh, I, you know, my visits to indigenous people, I was surprised how intelligent they are. And of course they have the traditional knowledge, but most of the indigenous leaders I've spoken to, they are very interested in gaining access to modern technologies that all have, are using smartphones today. So we are seeing, no, they, they want to keep their culture, which is very important. We have to re respect their rights, human rights. They want to keep the forest there, but they want also to bring technologies to add more value to the forest. So I, I'm very optimistic that the, the, you know, the, it's possible to merge, to bring the traditional knowledge to bear for this new model of development in which modern technology will also benefit them. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. We have a question from Emiliano Cabrera Rocha from the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge. He says, Dear Carlos, amazing presentation. Thanks. How much of Brazil's economy do you envision that Amazon 4.0 could take up? How are economic elites reacting now to this project? Well, the potential is, is true. Tremendous. I mean, when you look at uh, how Euro European nations are planning on advancing on a bioeconomy, although the European definition of bioeconomy is one to replace fossil fuels, a few, only a few uh, products out of the, the, the biomes of the biodiversity. Uh, but, you know, like countries like Germany plan by 2030, 30% 30 of GDP to come from uh, uh, this new bioeconomy. In US already 5% comes from bioeconomy, mostly biotechnology. So the poten in Brazil, it's something like 0.3%. So the potential is vast. So we have, have to realize that potential. So it's possible. Yes, I mean, Amazonian countries could plan for a large fraction of uh, GDP of the econ economy to, to be based on the potential of this new bioeconomy with forest products and industrialization of forest products. I think, you know, in Brazil, by 2030, if we develop this potential, it could get to five, even perhaps 10% of Brazilian economy could become related to this new bioeconomy. Thanks for that. We now have a question from a student. Her name is Eugenia Choi, and she says, first off, thank you so much for doing this. I'm a freshman environmental and sustainability studies major. I'm really interested in learning more about your research and vision. In what ways can students at WPI like me get more involved? Well, uh, thank you very much. I think, you know, try to well, first, you know, at WPI, you can do all the studies, you can work with the professors there, uh, developing all this beautiful concept of sustainability ecosystems, going to the detail if you, if you like, uh, you know, more engineering uh, oriented, uh, you can go to the technologies, or if you're more social science oriented, you can go to see how to create the social justice. Uh, that, I that would be my recommendation, but also please come to the Amazon. 
don't waste the opportunity eventually uh, and you can communicate with me. I can find ways for you perhaps to visit the Amazon throughout your undergraduate uh, time. Uh, you have to come to the Amazon. If you've never seen a tropical forest, you have to come. I, when I was perhaps your age, or not your age, I was a bit older, I was 20. For the first time, I visited the Amazon. I spent three weeks visiting many cities uh, and, and towns and villages in the Amazon. I fell in love with the Amazon. I was 20 years old, and that's why I dedicated all my career to the Amazon. So please make a plan to visit the Amazon. I love that answer. Um, one last question, that's what we have time for, from Trent Masiki. He asks, would you say more about the Quilombos and their relationship to economic development? Yes, uh, the Quilombos, the, the former African slaves, they, before Brazil, Brazil was the last country in the Americas to abolish slavery, it was 1888. And so, but the, the slaves then, they start really escaping from slavery and they start creating these communities called Quilombolas all over Brazil and many, many, many in the Amazon. And the Amazon was very good for them to do it because the Amazon at that time was completely remote. Other Quilombos in other parts of Brazil, they were attacked, they were seen by the the, the, the non-slaves as, uh, uh, you know, turmoil, uh, enemies, and there was mass assassinations. But in the Amazon, they were protected because it was totally remote. So there are many. There are more than 200. Uh, and they are, they got really very well merged with traditional knowledge of the indigenous people. They uh, really took a lot of the traditional knowledge into their uh, well-being in the way they produce products. So Quilombos are, in our perception, like indigenous populations, the indigenous people. They are Amazonian people. And also river Rhine populations, a lot who we went in the 19th century to for the rubber boom in the Amazon. And they got really very involved with the Amazon and they became also, they learned with the indigenous people. So they became also traditional population. They have a lot of knowledge. So we have really to bring all these populations to respect their human rights and the, uh, to give them the opportunity to use modern technologies to create industries. Why not to think about, uh, for instance, one of our uh, capacity development exercise 2021 will be in a quilombo in Pará State. So we're really hopeful that after we've been there, they will start a, a company, a, a chocolate producing company. Uh, so we want to hope to show the potential of modern industrialization within Amazonia communities. Thank you so much for that, Carlos, and for this whole talk. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your research with us, and I'm sure this entire audience would join me in giving you a round of applause if we were all together in person. Um, audience members, I'd like to let you know that right now we're going to transition to uh, a short video in which we're going to share some of WPI faculty's research in and on Latin America. And then we'll go live again with a faculty roundtable from Project Center directors that work in Latin America and the Caribbean. <laughs> I'm an academic writer, but I also write novels. In the year 2016, I wrote my first novel entitled La Rabia Útil de los Muertos, or The Useful Rage of Dead People, related to a catastrophic zombie outbreak. The catastrophic has been uh, an ever-present component in the history of the Caribbean, as we have witnessed in the past few years with a tremendous amount of hurricanes. But also the disasters come from colonialism, imperialism, and the failed promises of modernization. Uh, please just notice the hand in the little corner with the burger. It is meaningful. 
As an academic writer, uh, I have conducted research on the failed promises of modernity. In the year 2012, I came across a film made in Cuba entitled Juan de los Muertos or John of the Dead. In this film, I found intriguing how the Cubans, Cuban socialist system was portrayed, how the Cuban population dealt with the invasion of a zombie horde, on how a mysterious virus can destroy the advances of modern society. About this film, I wrote a long essay that became a conference paper, and that conference paper became quite successful. And somebody said to me, why don't you continue with this line of work? A light bulb went off in my head. I realized that no zombie horror, no zombie horror science fiction narrative has been produced in Puerto Rico, an excellent place for narratives about modernity and the catastrophic. Across Latin America, countries have rejected the Washington consensus, neoliberalism, and associated discourses of sustainable development by seeking new pathways and development that emphasize decolonization, environmental protection, livelihoods of, of citizens, and inclusive politics. Buen Vivir, or the good way of living, is one such pathway that is heralded as an ontological turn away from a development agenda that is dependent on interventionist policies of resource extraction, human rights violations, and environmental devastation. And indeed, Ecuador is a country that has been raised by structural adjustment policies um, and oil extraction over the past decades. In 2008, however, then President Rafael Correa etched Buen Vivir into the national constitution of Ecuador and promised the Ecuadorian people a new chapter in their development history, one that would be marked by rights of the environment, political inclusion, and massive social investment. A decade later, the Buen Vivir policies of the 2008 Constitution seem to be largely lip service, as policies that support large-scale resource extraction remain a distinctive and a prominent part of Ecuador's development plan. I'm a historian of Latin America, uh, but I'm also a historian of migration and migration theory and migration studies. Um, so I want to, um, you know, kind of show the value of historical research to even some contemporary issues. And I've learned that particularly from my students in my inquiry seminar on migration because they have to pick a, a migratory case and a migratory phenomenon every term, right? I teach it, which is once a year. Uh, and I'm able to see like the, the particularities and the universality of migratory experiences. And it's been a really, really valuable uh, experience. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, hybridity and uh, hyphenation within uh, migrant communities, but also ethnic communities, right? So children and grandchildren of migrants who form ethnic uh, communities in certain places. And my region of focus uh, is, uh, broadly speaking, something I typically call the Italian Atlantic, right? Which was all the places around the Atlantic that were, these are some of them, right? That were touched by Italian mass migration uh, from roughly the 1870s uh, to the 1920s. I'm in the Department of Humanities and Arts, and I teach Spanish and everything uh, related to that. So I work in the field of cultural geography in Latin America, and whether I'm thinking about past or present, I'm thinking about the notion of space. And I'm not talking about space like NASA space, but rather land, right? I'm thinking about it in literature, art, and film in, in particular. So questions like who demarcates land and how, who occupies territories and where, who describes places and why. And I think about these questions in particular as they relate to matters of gender, race, and environment. I explore a lot of these issues in my first book, which came out in 2017. It's called The Lines of Geography in Latin American Narrative, National Territory, National Literature, so a bit of a mouthful. But it digs down into the literary roots of 19th century geography in two areas, Argentina and Brazil in particular. I'm a global historian and a science and technology studies scholar. My work focuses on understanding how knowledge and technologies regarding socio-ecological issues are created, circulated, um, and contested across disciplines, institutions, and national borders. And in my talk today, I'm going to share with you the experience of a South American nation, Chile, 
with what is considered a major global ecological concern, nitrogen. And I'm going to argue that this experience, although similar to other cases in other nations, can provide a model for the study of science policy and the global struggle for environmental sustainability. So let's start talking about nitrogen. Nitrogen is mostly present on Earth in unreactive forms. Uh, that means it is chemically unavailable to most living organisms and must be fixed you know, into a reactive form to, before animals and plants can use it. Scientific knowledge on the nitrogen cycle has significantly increased since the 1950s. Today, we have a better understanding on the many human sources of nitrogen and its multiple ecological effects. Scientists even predict increasing rates of reactive nitrogen during the following decades, especially in places like Latin America, Asia, and Africa. What is the social and solidarity economy? Um, this is an alternative economic strategy that puts the importance of social connection and the environment ahead of profit, or at least on the same, on par with profit. It's often referred to also as a collective economy. And we can see the growth of the social, so, social and solidarity economy as evidence that um, there is a shift in how we view economics and that we're beginning to see a more collective approach to understanding economics. One of the key issues about the social and solidarity economy that's important to this research is that generally it is locally based and comes from the bottom up from the community where it started. Washington State University professor Brian McNeil claims that mestizo identity encompasses far more than racial and ethnic mixing. It also involves a uniquely synergistic state of mind with, quote, frameworks that are devoid of notions of cultural, genetic, gender, or sexual orientation superiority, a mindset that questions boundaries that prioritizes relationships of equality over relationships of domination. My current writing project embraces this mestizo perspective. It's a collaborative novel written with my colleague Kate McIntyre featuring a mixed race protagonist navigating a world where strange fungi sprouting from the Earth's mycelial network have given dogs the capacity to acquire human language. During the novel, the protagonist's mind state gradually shifts from the rigid domineering perspective of his father to the more open, non-hierarchical perspective of his immigrant mother. And I'm going to share the beginning of my novel. Um, the story starts with the protagonist at a weight loss summer camp right before the world changes forever. As you can see in the novel's early stages, the narrator, Tom, views the world in strict binaries, skinny and overweight, white and non-white, authentic and fake, friend and enemy. By the novel's end, Tom's worldview will shift dramatically as he embraces a mestizo identity and all its contradictions and permeabilities. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for sticking with us. I'm Lorene Elgert. I'm a part of the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Initiative at WPI. Um, and I'm going to lead us into the next section of our program, which is a roundtable with some of our faculty. Uh, this roundtable welcomes five project center directors to reflect on the origins and experiences of WPI's commitment in Latin America. Uh, successes and challenges of sustainability and community engagement, and what this has meant for faculty and students. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce William San Martin. Um, as a science and technology schol studies scholar, William was awarded a Global Lab Fellowship in 2019-20, where he undertook research on the impacts of the IQP program on transnational knowledge and technology, and technology transfer. So William will offer a few words to open our round table, uh, and then we'll proceed with talking with each of our individual project uh, center directors. William. Thank you, Lorraine, for the introduction. Um, I would like to use these few minutes uh, to highlight a couple of lessons that I consider critical when we think about the role of our project centers in issues of justice and sustainability across the Americas. Um, before I jump into my talk, I would like to say that these insights, as you said, Lorraine, were part of a preliminary research project that I conducted while a fellow at the Global Lab. This project would not have been possible without the support from Arthur Carson and Amy Smith from WPI's archive and the work of two of our students, Patrick O'Millan and Cecilia Schroeder. 
they assisted with their covered research and were criti a critical part of drafting some of the arguments I will share with you all today. Can we jump to the next slide, please? Um, and I, I would like to start with a quote. Courses in social sciences have been often required in science and engineering curricula. While valuable in themselves, there was no experimental component which brought into physical reality for the students the social, political, and humanistic dimension of their technological world. Each graduate at WPI is now expected to qualify in a field project, which is designated to develop a greater awareness of the relationships between science and engineering on one hand and social concern and human values in the other. This component of the WPI program has proven to be one of the most fascinating." End quote. These are some of the words expressed in the final report of the National Science Foundation Advisory Panel released in 1975, evaluating the first years of the WPI plan. And give me, let me give you some context here. During the early 1970s, public criticism of technology and its negative social uh, and ecological impacts increase in the US. Engineers, along with a broader group of STEM professionals, were to blame for their lack of understanding and vision of how technological systems take place in complex sociopolitical and cultural contexts, especially when working in foreign lands with unfamiliar environments, communities, and languages. STEM-oriented institutions reacted by launching reforms to their engineering curricula. Significant changes took place in institutions like MIT, Caltech, and other STEM-oriented organizations. These changes led to the creation of humanities and social sciences departments, the expansion of faculty hires, and a specific programs fostering a kind of expertise that was imagined at the intersection of STEM and the social sciences and the humanities. As many higher education leaders phrase it in internal documents and professional meetings, engineering expertise and education were in crisis. The humanities and social sciences were required to save engineering from its imminent collapse. Next, please. As we see in this publication in the New York Times in 1973, featuring the WPI plan, many internal leaders and external observers frame these changes as a way to build a new engineer, a more humanistic one. Next slide, please. The acknowledgement that human problems and human values, either we want it or not, are at the center of the work of STEM professionals became a guiding principle in how many saw the changes implemented by the WPI plan. Next one, please. Both the expressions humanist technologies and technological humanists were broadly used in internal documents and the media to describe this new graduate. Now, many of these changes occur in STEM institutions across the United States, and WPI was no exception. However, as described in my initial quote, what was radically different was the experimental component and physical reality that interactive qualifying projects and off-campus centers brought to students and faculty. And here I would like to suggest that the WPI network of project centers were a fundamental departure from other curricular changes in STEM institutions in the US at the time. Now, we know that off-campus centers remained very local during the first years. That meant the social, political, and humanistic dimensions of a student's learning processes also remain local and very narrow in a scope. Next slide, please. From the mid-1970s to the late 1980s, the internationalization of off-campus centers remained constrained within North America and Western Europe. It is only until the early 1990s, with the establishment of the first centers in Latin America and Asia, that, that these projects started involving what we call today the global south or the developing world, and therefore issues of human values and cultures unique to these regions. This provided a completely new vision and experience of how human values, culture, and politics means for technological systems outside industrialized nations. Next one, please. 
So what lessons can we take from this history? Um, thank you. To answer these questions, I would like to use two examples, the opening of the project center in Puerto Rico and Ecuador in the early 1990s. But in this time frame, Latin America was experiencing profound democratization process, opening up issues of political violence, but also opening up new markets. Simultaneously, the profound negative impacts of development and political programs supported by the United States in the region since the 1960s were becoming increasingly evident at both sides of the border. Issues of economic development, inequalities, violence, and the environment in this region were understood as problems of profound transnational nature that could not be answered with a narrow national perspective. At the same time, as many leaders on campus recognize, Hispanic and Latino populations were increasing across the US and in central Massachusetts. In combination, many of these processes provided a sense of urgency for new transnational, inter-American, transcultural approaches to engineering education. Next one, please. In this context, the establishment of the Puerto Rico Center and the agreement with Universidad de Puerto Rico Mayagüez was considered a strategic uh, movement to link the mainland United States with Latin America. Puerto Rico was envisioned as a critical program to bridge issues of multiculturalism, multilingualism, colonialism, and economic development, not only across, but in this case, within political and cultural borders. The Puerto Rico Center acknowledged that the students project will not only assist the Puerto Rican community in the island, but also address the profound demographic changes in the US and issues of diversity on campus. As some of the WPI leaders at the time acknowledged, the establishment of the Puerto Rico Center meant opening new opportunities to make the WPI campus more attractive to Hispanic students from both the United States and Latin America. Next one, please. Around the same time, the Escuela Superior Politécnica del Litoral, SPOL, in Guayaquil, Ecuador, and WPI established an agreement focused on interdisciplinary studies of environmental sciences and management. This center was unique at the time because besides providing opportunities for undergraduate students projects, it also established a formal program for faculty and graduate students exchange between both institutions. Participants consider coordinating research a critical and innovative way to take advantage of both institutions' expertise. Next one, please. And I would like to finish with this, uh, a couple of final reflections on the lessons that I take. Although in the process of globalization of the WPI curriculum after this period to the present, issues of diversity, social justice, and sustainability are extensive, the establishment of these first centers in Latin America consolidated a distinct path. First, they embrace a profoundly transnational, transregional, and transcultural perspective. In this sense, the study of social inequalities and environmental management were not considered a Puerto Rican or Ecuadorian problem, but problems whose origins and ramifications were shaped by social, economic, and cultural processes across borders, including the United States. Second, the social and human dimensions of technology embedded in the origins of the WPI plan took a new form shaped by issues of economic dependency, colonialism, and multilingualism. Many of them are today at the center of conversations about global environmental justice and sustainable development. Finally, participant organizations saw these partnerships as strategic for development of local communities and higher institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean, but also to address critical issues of diversity, social justice and inclusion in the mainland US and the WPI campus. Through these partnerships, PQP syllabi on campus started integrating new readings about development and the environment. Ecuadorian scholars completed graduate studies in WPI. New faculty hires in Spanish and Spanish training increased uh, its importance for the expansion of these programs. 
students and faculty started embracing concerns about the developing world, poverty and colonialism, global inequalities and sustainability in ways that other, just few other project centers could offer. Today, we're having this event to celebrate the launching of the Global School. We're also celebrating the establishment of a new minor in Latin American and Caribbean studies and uh, our grant from the education, uh, from the US Education Department that would help us expand and integrate efforts in the region. In many ways, all of these achievements seem nat a natural consequence of the radical curricular changes established 50 years ago and the efforts to globalize and maybe Latin Americanize our curriculum initiated in the 1990s. The question that I would like to ask everyone today is how do we want to proceed for the next 50 years? How do we keep expanding and continue strengthening these projects? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, William. That was um, fascinating context and insight into WPI's project centers in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, so now uh, we will direct some questions to our faculty roundtable. Um, I'll introduce them as we go. And we'll start with um, Professor Aaron Sekulich, who is the project center director of the Panama Project Center. Aaron, why did you get involved with the Panama Project Center? And what keeps you interested and engaged there? So uh, I got involved with the Panama Project Center the way that I get involved with everything in my life, which is to say completely accidentally. I fell backwards into it. Um, to understand why, a little bit about my background is that um, I, I went to a very conventional engineering university, the type that William was just speaking about. And uh, during my education, we were always told that there are two things in the world. There's engineering and there's things that are not worth doing because only engineering can improve the world and only engineering can lead to progress. And at the time, I, I believed that. And um, I had never left the country before. I had barely even left the state of Pennsylvania. And then during my third year of graduate school, due to what I presume was a clerical error, I was awarded a Fulbright grant to study in Morocco for a year. So it was my first time out of the country and it was an unspeakably meaningful experience. The Aaron that came back and the Aaron that went there would not recognize each other if they bumped into each other on the street. Uh, so then when I started at WPI, the project system was part of the appeal for coming to WPI. Uh, after going to Morocco, I realized the, the world is a huge, interesting place. I traveled all over. I went to Tunisia, uh, Tunisia Egypt, India, Thailand, Iceland, Syria, a bunch of places. Um, but I thought about the Global Projects Program kind of the same. It was, you know, tourism. I'd, I'd apply maybe to the Australia Project Center and big drinks and tiny umbrellas on the beach, that kind of thing. And so then before I got tenure, I was doing what everybody pre-tenure does, which is cranking out grant proposals one after another. And I was writing one for the NSF's International uh, REU program. And because I had lived in Morocco, I was trying to write it about Morocco and it wasn't coming together. It was not a good proposal. So I'd work on that at work. And then when I went home, I had a book that I was reading that I bought at Brimfield called Panama Passage. And I cannot stress enough, this is not a good book. It doesn't know if it's a romance or an adventure, shallow character, awful. But I would struggle with trying to make this grant proposal come together. And then I'd go and read about Panama. And eventually, it took much longer than it should have. It occurred to me, we have a project center in Panama. And uh, so I started learning about it. At the time, it was run by Tahar al Korchi, and it was only for NQPs. It had been established in 2010. Um, but it really made a lot of sense for the proposal I was writing, in particular because we get a lot of support from our alumni network down there. There's a lot of Panamanians that have gone to WPI that are very, very generous with their time and expertise in helping us set it up. So I was eventually awarded that grant, again, presumably a clerical error. And um, because I got the grant, they asked me to become part of the project center. And at that time, 
the MQP was what I valued. It's, it's, it's engineering. Uh, little by little, uh, I started learning more and more about the IQP, kind of absorbing it from the people I was interacting with in uh, IGSD. And so we eventually decided to expand uh, the Panama site to um, uh, support IQPs. And in fact, Lorene and I wrote a grant proposal, which again was funded because this one was good. She had a big part in it, no clerical error. Um, and we got funding to send the first IQP team down to Panama, which I will always remember. What a wonderful team that was. And being involved in the Panama Project Center has really made it clear to me the brilliance of the WPI plan that William was talking about earlier. It is something that is, is direly needed. Uh, all those people that told me engineering was the only important thing were incredibly wrong. Um, and it's also, it's, it's not study abroad. It's not service learning. It's the one thing WPI has that nobody else uh, comes even close to replicating. And so me personally, I don't believe that things happen for a reason. Frankly, if they do, somebody's got a lot of explaining to do, especially after this year. Um, I believe that sometimes things just happen and sometimes things happen to you. And I often reflect on how happy I am that this book was called Panama Passage and not New York Passage or Kansas Passage or something like that. Uh, because my involvement in the Project Center, one, um, it, it, it's just something truly unique and so useful for the students. And it's, it's meant a lot to me personally as well. Excellent, thanks so much. That was, that was um, a nice account of both the emotional, uh, personal and professional advantages of being involved with the Project Center, right? Thank you, Erin. Um, next, let's hear from Arthi Madan. She is uh, the director of the Buenos Aires Project Center. Arthi, where are you? I'm here. There you are. <laughs> Arthi, why did you create a humanities and arts project center in Buenos Aires? Thanks, Laureen, for that question. I'm sort of the antithesis of Erin in some ways because I fell in love with Buenos Aires um, at a very young age, 21, I traveled there uh, all by myself for my first independent research project. Um, the college that I went to had a project-based curriculum as well, except our projects happened in the month of January and our junior and senior year, we could design them on our own. Um, and sort of in the fortuitous way that the research sometimes stands out, uh, I wound up studying Jewish immigration from Buenos Aires to Israel. Um, so that was in 2004, there was an economic crisis in Buenos Aires. It was a great time to be an undergrad on a shoestring budget in a cosmopolitan city. Um, and about a year and a half later, I wound up at the University of Pittsburgh doing my PhD uh, with one of the world's foremost experts on Jew Jewishness in the, the Latin American imaginary. Um, again, as research works out, um, I ended up changing course a bit and still wound up back in Argentina thinking about questions of identity, um, but I was thinking about identity more in terms of the relationship between land and, and literature um, in, in 19th century Latin America, um, so what we call environmental humanities. Uh, Buenos Aires is just an incredible, incredible place to do research. Um, it's chock full of bookstores and, and uh, big archives, libraries, museums to visit. Um, and then you can go to these wonderful cafes and sit and write and mull and drink good coffee. Um, and I knew, I knew long ago that I wanted to take students to Buenos Aires at one point. So in 2010, when I was fortunate enough to land a job at WPI in the middle of a global recession, um, I couldn't have been more psyched to have had a department head who really wanted a humanities and arts program somewhere in Latin America. And I knew I wanted to take students to, to Argentina to do kind of a more traditional study abroad, some, something where they could really hone their language skills in an authentic cultural context, right? Sometimes with IQP, students are kind of in bubbles where they are um, doing, doing really fascinating work, but they're not necessarily getting that cultural component as much. So this was the focus. Um, I, I jumped at the chance, I got the job in, in August, designed the program that fall and had students abroad that summer of 2011. 
Um, so in, in many ways, this, this program stands out from other project centers for a couple of main reasons. Um, it's the only program where students live with host families. Um, they eat meals with these host families for their entire stay, which isn't such a radical idea elsewhere, but it really does um, make a difference in terms of cultural exposure. Um, also, we're different because the students are attending classes every day for four weeks at our partner institution, uh, which is Universidad de San Andres. Um, it, they have a, a campus right in the heart of downtown Buenos Aires. And, you know, compared to, to our students, some of our students' hometowns, uh, Worcester is something of a, a metropolis, right? But relative to Buenos Aires, which is a very bustly city, uh, Worcester is sub subdued and, and sleepy. So the students get there and they have this sort of shock and then they have this transformation over the course of the term as they really become experts at navigating not only um, the city and its unique, unique public transportation system, but also the Argentine accent um, is different from what a lot of them have been exposed to in their previous Spanish classes in the United States. So they start just utterly lost, um, but then they end up knowing more than me in some ways because they're there on the ground as young people, right? And, and a lot of them are, are in between their freshman and sophomore year. So, you know, for me to tell them, I'm not gonna shepherd you to a graffiti tour, or I'm not gonna, you know, take you by the hand to a theater, rather meet me there, figure it out. And they do, they really do figure it out. Um, we get the opportunity also to travel outside of the city. We do excursions to uh, Iguazu Falls. Um, I get to see them and their faces as they are seeing this, this magical, wondrous place for the first time. Um, I take them to uh, Colonia, which is in Uruguay, so they get another stamp in their, in their passport. Um, it's just kind of an opportunity for them to really um, experience life in, in, a, in, a, in a language, right? That's kind of a very different way of, of engaging with, with, with life. So I gotta say that I really get to spend a lot of time with the students in Argentina, um, which is different. I've advised in Costa Rica and in Puerto Rico, and I really do love seeing their growth firsthand. It's, it's a subjective and imperfect um, impression, but nevertheless, it's there. I can see their individual learning gains and their language gains and their confidence, right, uh, from beginning to end. So the program is, is one unit. Um, one third of it they spend uh, at the University of San Andres with a professor. Her name is Vale Teti, and she's wonderful. Um, another third is a class that I or the on site faculty advisor, which in 2018, John Galante accompanied them. Um, so he'll uh, or I will teach a class to them. And then the third component of the unit is an independent research project that uh, they design uh, on their own with faculty guidance. And the range of projects has really been fascinating. A great deal sit at the intersection of environment and culture, um, whether they're thinking about um, literature and art um, and, and how they connect with ecological consciousness or, or um, I had a student think about uh, the impact of civil engineering on indigenous communities in Iguazu Falls. Um, it's just, a, it's, there's a lot of autonomy in the program. And, and ultimately I love it because it's uh, an opportunity for them to get real independence um, in, in this sort of cultural buffet of Buenos Aires. And they come back with a, with a greater sense of, of themselves as global citizens, as humanists, um, and really as, as adults. Amazing, thank you. It sounds like your long-term engagement with Buenos Aires turns into the students' long-term engagement with Buenos Aires, right? Definitely. Very, very nice. Thank you so much, Arthi. Um, Let's progress, let's proceed with uh, our, next, our, our next project center director. And that is Lauren Matthews. I'm here. Hi, Lauren. Um, Lauren is the uh, project center director in Port for the P Puerto Rico project center, the, the actually the first project center in Latin America that was established at WPI. So Lauren, how does the Puerto Rico Project Center provides students with a unique Latin American experience? Uh, so great, thanks for the question, Laureen. Um, Puerto Rico is indeed, um, it's the second oldest of the WPI Project Centers, I think, and as you mentioned, the oldest of the Latin American centers, certainly. Um, it's now approaching its 
30th anniversary. Um, that should be not this upcoming cycle, but next year um, it should hit its 30th anniversary. Um, so I've only been the director of the center for about six to seven years, um, and I'm by no means an expert on Puerto Rico, um, but I have had a lot of opportunity over these years to um, really watch our students and observe um, some of the ways in which they, um, in, in which I can predict that they're going to change as a result of their experiences in Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico, as I think probably everyone in the audience knows, um, it's unique in Latin America in terms of its relationship with the United States, um, as it occupies a, a position that's somewhere between um, the rest of Latin America and the US um, in, in many domains, and that includes cultural, um, social, and economic um, aspects. So um, these, uh, this, so this complex relationship between both Latin America and the United States affects, um, I think, pretty much all aspects of life on the island of Puerto Rico. Um, and there's a clear tension um, between these two influences that, that makes itself evident in many ways. Um, and I think gives Puerto Ricans um, a unique sense of identity and in many ways, I think, um, sometimes manifesting itself as an identity crisis. Um, in some ways, I, my impression is that Puerto Rico receives sometimes the best of both influences and benefits from this intermediate placement, um, not being really a full, fully integrated part of Latin America, but not really being a fully integrated part of the United States either. Um, but in other contexts, um, the island does suffer as a result of this um, sort of intermediate placement. Um, and this has both um, policy and cultural um, implications on the island. So for Puerto Ricans, um, the island's relationship with the United States, I think structures daily life in many ways that um, are both conscious and unconscious. Um, and I think they think about it a lot. It's a subject of frequent consideration for them and affects so many, so many parts of daily life. But for our students, the relationship between the United States and any of its territories is pretty foreign to them. They may have studied um, some of the political relationships between the US and territories and the historical relationships, but um, being on the ground and really understanding um, the, the implications for the people of those territories is brand new to them. Um, so this reality um, on the ground in Puerto Rico means that our projects and our students um, who are almost entirely United States citizens um, and are usually visiting Latin America for the first time. So they have to confront and um, wrestle with these questions about their own identity, I think. Um, what does it mean to be an American? And how does that differ from what it means to be a United States citizen? So what are the rights and responsibilities of a US citizen? Um, how does that um, result in common experiences between Puerto Ricans um, and other US citizens? Um, and what's the role of culture and cultural differences um, in defining a national identity? Um, so a particular interest, I think, of course, is the question of statehood. So st our students have to think about, they discover quickly that Puerto Ricans are um, conflicted about this question of statehood. Um, and they have to, they are forced to think about why would Puerto Ricans be conflicted about this question. So in order to understand um, why people have these internal conflicts, and I don't think they ever get a perfect understanding, but they do think about it. Um, so our students have to understand that um, from the perspective of the people of Puerto Rico, statehood would involve probably both gains and um, sacrifices. Um, and I don't think that our students have really ever confronted that idea or um, find it really easy to internalize and think about that idea that being a state for Puerto Ricans would, be, would have both positives and negatives. Um, so students um, get a chance to explore these ideas both through their projects, um, which almost entirely, um, almost universally involve strong involvement with local communities. That's um, a theme that we always seek out in our sponsors, but I think that our um, partner sponsors um, in Puerto Rico are particularly um, dedicated to this kind of um, bottom-up community involvement work. Um, so our students are almost always interacting um, closely with members of the local community to the extent that their kind of limited Spanish speaking skills allow. 
Um, but they also confront these questions um, just on their day-to-day -day interactions, um, informal interactions with everyone um, they meet, everyone they interact with um, in Puerto Rico. Um, and I think that all of these interactions in the project and outside the project um, really encourage students to think more carefully, more thoughtfully about their own backgrounds, their own experiences and their own biases um, and how these factors um, have kind of shaped their life experiences so far. Um, and I don't think that students come back from Puerto Rico um, incredibly wise um, and you know, um, really being able to think about their own identity and other identities. But I think they have the seeds of this um, process as a result of this experience. And I, I hope that they continue to grow and, and develop um, some more uh, ability to, to understand the world a little differently. That's that. Wow, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think in all the project centers, we think of, you know, um, the travel and the cultural immersion and, and sort of the growth of political awareness and stuff as part of the learning aside from project learning. But it sounds like um, Puerto Rico certainly has something um, unique in that in that department. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, and it also provides us a great segue to our next um, our next um, project center director, who is Courtney Kurlanska. Uh, Courtney uh, is the director of the Ecuador Project Center. Hi, I'm here. Give her a minute to get on the screen. Hi, Courtney. Um, Courtney, how does the Ecuador Project Center prepare students for a lifetime of global engagement? That's a great question. Um, and I'd actually like to edit it a little bit. Uh, I'd like to say it's a lifetime of global ethical engagement. I think one of the things we focus on and emphasize at the Ecuador Project Center is making sure our students understand the ethical implications of what they're doing and how they can and do that. And we start by modeling that with the way we come up with our projects. And all of our projects are driven by community organizations. They all come from the bottom up. Right, so it links to a lot of what Lauren was saying in her presentation. But I think um, that is one of our primary focus. And by having the students see and understand how we come up with these projects and we talk them through where the projects came from and the different organizations we're working with and helping them understand that these are all projects that the people support and want. And that in order for these projects to be successful and in order for them to have value to the community, that's how it, that's how it has to start, right? Um, so even when we work with um, larger governmental organizations, because we do, we work with um, state-run organizations, we work with NGOs, we work with small uh, foundations, um, at the core of all of our projects is this level of community engagement. Right, where the students interact with individuals. And um, I, one of the most recent projects that we worked on last year was with ATAPA, which is um, an organization that's in charge of the local water resources. And this team of students um, went into this project with a very technological mindset. They're like, oh, we're gonna be mapping these zones of where the forest fires are and all of this kind of stuff. And they, they did all this research to do like this technical analysis of the problem. And they get on the ground and um, they were shocked in some ways to realize that, well, yeah, the mapping's part of it, but they found out that their sponsor really just wanted them to talk to the locals and talk to community members to understand what they could do because there were plans for forest fire mitigation, which is what the project was about. Um, but I think the sponsor really helped them to understand that it doesn't matter what we as a government agencies tell them to do. If it's not appropriate, if it's not coming from um, the community level, they're not going to do it. It's, it's, they're not going to engage with it. So um, those, that team, which um, was all, all women actually, um, were out with these um, technical surveyors and they were out there and they would go in, into these farming communities and talk to the farmers and try to understand the situation. And they really grew a lot through that experience in understanding the importance of incorporating that local um, perspective. And towards the end of their, towards the end of their project, 
um, they got a call from their director and he's like, we got to go, you got to get in the car. We got to go see this. And he drove them up to a mountain they'd been to maybe three weeks prior. And it was in the zone where they were creating this forest fire mitigation plan. And it was all burned. A forest fire had come through the previous night and um, this, the girls, I was, or the women, I was surprised at first. I was like, oh no, they're gonna be devastated. They're gonna throw their hands up in the air and say, why are we doing this? What's the point? Um, and I think maybe they thought that for 15, 20 minutes. Um, but I was so proud when they came back to me with the realization that, you know what? This just shows that the work we're doing is so important, right? Because it helps us to understand that it's really needed and it's really valued. And uh, they did end up completing the development of the plan and the pre-COVID times, at least, the goal was that that was gonna be a model and they were gonna replicate um, that um, forest fire mitigation plan in different communities and different watersheds all around the country, right? So I think those kinds of experiences where they get to see firsthand the importance of their work and what they can do and what they can bring um, is important. But even more than seeing what they can do is what they can learn. So I think one of the most important things that we help them to understand is that the strength of the program and the strength of what they do at the Ecuador Project Center is really in listening and learning from others. And so for me, I think one of the things we do to promote this global engagement and ethical engagement is to flip the narrative for our students coming from the US who think that they come in with all the answers but really what they have are the questions um, and they need to talk with individuals and find the answers locally by understanding the, the situation and working with the people. Thank you, Courtney. That was really interesting and impactful. And I think, um, yeah, when you said flip the narrative, that's exactly the words that occurred to me as you were telling the story. Um, and, and I also thought of flipping the narrative in terms of who, where does expertise lie and who's the expert and who's the teacher. Sometimes it's not us, us as teachers either. It's, it's, we're just putting students in touch with the real teachers, right? Yep. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have uh, Melissa Bells. Hi, everyone. Hi, Melissa. Melissa is um, the Project Center Director for Costa Rica. There's two sites in Costa Rica, in uh, Monteverde and in San Jose. Um, and um, Melissa, I think we were going to ref re reference the Monteverde Project Center in particular, but it's up okay. to you how you um, wish to answer um, my question, which is, how does the Monteverde Project Center help students to link sustainability with social justice? Okay, so I guess I can blend them a little bit too. Uh, it was four years ago that um, I began the Project Center in Monteverde because it seemed like a unique opportunity to have a project center in a small town. Um, and it has a dense pool of scientists working on biodiversity, sustainability, conservation, climate. Um, and there was a high demand for projects in San Jose. Uh, with its focus on sustainability and environment. And we're usually working in cities because they have enough opportunities for projects year after year. And Monteverde actually has a lot of project opportunities because there's so much good work going on in a small place. Um, so what has naturally evolved um, that I, I didn't necessarily expect, but like Courtney mentioned, these projects come from the community. They don't come from us. Um, they're not top down from WPI, but we have so many projects that are focused on community empowerment in Monteverde. And because a sustainable um, livelihood is the foundation of the town, the projects don't have to be so overtly environmental. Um, that's just sort of a given within the context. So for example, we've worked with, um, for three years, the World Trails Network, which is developing a long distance trail hiking from mountain to coast, and they are promoting reforestation. 
but an underlying motivation is that, and it's what the students contribute to, is to bring the tourist economy into these small villages and give them the opportunity to have a say in the process. Um, so it's less just about reforestation or you know, um, outdoor recreation. And we've worked on the beginning stages of an organic farmers association to expand um, local sales of their products. We've worked with a, a really interesting group called Sail Cargo that's building a zero emission um, sailing cargo vessel uh, that students helped plan their reinvestment scheme to reinvest any profits of the company into local producers who wouldn't necessarily write for a grant, but still they might need a new tractor, for example. Um, a team is currently working on a project for alternative currency. So people can earn credit in Monteverde for volunteering or for pro-environmental behavior. And when you can use that credit for food, that means more equity for the whole community. And at the same time, it's promoting and encouraging sustainable practices and taking care of your neighbors. Um, students are also working on a project to create a shared transportation system that's reimagining all of the, the small shuttle buses that are grounded from the pandemic. And it will get cars off the road. It will improve some of the tourist experience, but it also helps workers significantly um, by converting this tourist convenience into a real community asset moving forward. Um, and so the current pandemic has forced the community to really uh, reassess a lot of its um, current models. And in the end, yes, it is a dense network of scientists and people who care about the environment. And we love that, the students love that, they want environmental projects, but it's also just an incredibly tight knit community where everyone knows everyone and they, they all wanna support each other. Um, the town was started by Quakers and they are pacifists, they're collaborative, and they're the original conservationists for the watershed and the hillsides. So the community still holds those values and the student projects just reflect that. They reflect what's coming out of the community. Um, so all the projects are intertwined and one project supporting or influencing another or reaping the benefits of another WPI project that's just going on in the community. Um, I didn't expect that even knowing it was such a small community, um, but I think that's what really makes it unique. And I hope the students see that even though they can't go there this year, uh, you can still feel it in the way the six projects that are being prepared for right now are all interconnected and the sponsors all know each other and they feel like one project supports another. Um, I also hope that the students start to connect that environmental justice is also very closely tied to social justice. Thank you, Melissa. That was, that was really interesting. And I think it, it sort of also tunes into a message that we've been listening to for this entire series, right? This entire um, event. And that is that social, the fundamental social basis of sustainability. So thank you so much for that. Okay, um, so that wraps up our roundtable. Um, as sort of a uh, you know a, a sort of a farewell to you all, we wanted to do one one more quick round, and give you two words that describe the future of our project center, just for a bit of fun. So um, why don't we do just a, a a lightning round? Let's start back at the beginning with Aaron. Two words to describe the future. The future um, of your project center. Well, it's 2020, so I'm not going to bet a horse one way or the other, frankly. Um, I would say perhaps better integrated. Uh, I mean, that's two words, but I mean it is one phrase. Two words, okay. Yeah, and um, sustainable. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Arthi. Uh, let's go with enduring and Brazil. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, you guys are creating a lot of mystique here. Lauren, yeah. <laughs> what are your two words? 
I want to say hurricane and pandemic, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, I'll be optimistic and say um, um, like broader impacts, I would say. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Courtney, what are your two words? Socially engaged. Wonderful. And Melissa, back to you to, to round things off. Buena vida. Buena vida. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I really enjoyed uh, listening to all of your stories. I learned so much more about all of my, my treasured colleagues. I, um, I, it was just wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I'll, uh, that wraps up our roundtable. Awesome, Laureen. Thank you so much for facilitating that. And thank you to the rest of you for being a part of it. Um, it's been awesome to hear about project-centered directors talking about student experiences at our project centers, but we thought it might be nice for you all who are still with us. Thank you for being here with us still. Uh, we want you to hear the student voices. So here we have about eight minutes of student reflections from four students who really integrated Latin America and the Caribbean into their entire course of study at WPI. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, my name is Katie Piccioni. I am in the class of 2016. I did a double major in mechanical engineering and society technology and policy. And I now work at the Federal Emergency Management Agency where uh, I figure out how to use aerial imagery, maps, and other geospatial technologies in disaster response and recovery. Um, while I was at WPI, all three of my main projects related to Latin America. My IQP was in Costa Rica, where my team worked with the Costa Rican Ministry of Agriculture to, um, to evaluate an organic farming training program that they were running with farmers in the region. For my MQP, I worked with La Fundación Paraguaya in Paraguay to design a class for their students on how to build rainwater collection systems to improve water security. Um, and part of the project was to figure out how to design, you know, design and build rainwater harvesting systems using locally available materials. Um, and then for my humanities inquiry seminar, uh, I actually did my inquiry seminar on research methods and writing, where I studied pictorial literacy. Um, you know, how, how do we understand and interpret images? But this was applied to a, an extracurricular project I was part of, also related to Latin America, um, with, with Engineers Without Borders. At the time, Engineers Without Borders was working on a project in, with a community in rural Guatemala to build, uh, to build rainwater collection systems. And one of the problems was how to, how to design training materials that were appropriate for people who, didn't, who were illiterate and didn't, you know, didn't know how to read. Um, and so through my inquiry seminar, I came up with a set of guidelines for how to create culturally appropriate training, picture-based training materials. Hey everyone, my name is Princesa and I graduated in 2016 uh, an ECE with a Spanish minor. I started taking Spanish courses as part of the humanities requirement and I later switched into a minor as well as the humanities because I was really interested in the courses. Um, I took things like comparative business environments, um, topics in Latin American culture, uh, contemporary US Latino literature. And I really liked all of them because I'm Latina and they were probably the first courses I took as a student ever that really made me feel like I was connected to something and it helped sort of define my, my, my own life experiences and where I feel in history overall. And I found them just really fascinating. I had really great teachers. I also did my IQP in Puerto Rico and me and my team worked with the U.S. Forest Service to do climate change curriculum materials for middle schoolers. And there, I really enjoyed what we were doing. I felt like I could just put in my all. And it was a really amazing experience that honestly changed my whole career path. Um, after graduating, I actually went to the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, to do a master's in electrical engineering. I actually applied for a master's in research, or a master's of research is what they call it out there, in Latin American studies. And there, again, I just loved the field. I loved everything I did. We 
had a really small intimate course so we could talk to the professors about anthropology and human rights and current events and pre-Columbian history um, and in London I also spent a lot of time in Colombian communities Ecuadorian Peruvian Bolivian um, I volunteered at a trade union that had a lot of people from all over Latin America um, and my thesis actually was on uh, Puerto Rico and the um, Hurricane Maria, how it impacted the island and how it related to Puerto Rican economic history and um, the colonial past and its current political, sta uh, political status as a territory of the U.S. So that's sort of what my trajectory has been and really all of it's been influenced by just starting off in humanities courses at WPI. Hi, my name is Jack Rubbs, and I graduated in the class of 2019 with my BS in Mechanical Engineering. Uh, I then proceeded on to uh, finish my BSMS program in Material Science and Engineering the following semester. And now I'm in my first year of my PhD studies uh, in Material Science and Engineering at WPI. Um, so basically, the way that my experience with Latin America began was during my IQP. Uh, at WPI, uh, where I went abroad to uh, Cuenca, Ecuador um, for seven weeks during C term. Um, it was a really exciting experience. Um, I was able to work uh, with a few of my peers um, on a project with the Public Works Department in Cuenca. Um, and it was basically uh, surrounding the nature of farming practices um, and how that was impacting uh, water quality uh, basically throughout the whole city really cool experience. We were able to really uh, get a lot of exciting uh, encounters with like local farmers um, and seeing what their practices were like. We were invited onto their farms. Um, we worked really closely with, with members of the Public Works Department and we're actually still in touch with them today via social media. Um, it was a really exciting experience. I definitely never would have been able to have this if I weren't participating uh, in, in WPI's global uh, project experience. Um, it was cool to see that we could actually, even with just very little experience on our end, we were able to go into another society and, and really impact them positively. Um, we're able to develop a program of, of different, um, you know, best farming practices. And we kind of evaluated our, uh, the relationships between the farmers and the public works department. And we were able to provide some suggestions upon how they would be able to communicate with them better. And it was really from a social science perspective rather than, um, you know, like a technical environmental science perspective, which was really kind of enriching for us um, as engineers or, or aspiring engineers, um, because it was kind of able to give us an experience that made us a little bit more well-rounded in that regard. Um, and, you know, they were actually able to eventually implement some of our recommendations, which, which was really cool for us to see um, back, back in the U.S. Hi, I'm Kristen, and I graduated from WPI in 2014 with a double major in biology and Spanish. And while at WPI, I was incredibly fortunate to study abroad in Latin America four different times. Uh, I first traveled to Argentina at the end of my freshman year when I participated in the Buenos Aires uh, Cultural Immersion Program, where we basically spent one month living in the city, um, living with a host family, studying at a, at, a, at a language school, and learning about the culture and the history of both the city and the country of Argentina. And it was really through this experience that I gained immense confidence in myself, stepped out of my comfort zone, vastly improved my Spanish. I also met one of my mentors at WPI and several of my closest friends. But it was really through this experience that I fell in love with Latin America and ultimately decided to pursue a double major in Spanish uh, at WPI. And I love this experience so much that I actually decided to travel back to Argentina at the end of my sophomore year in 2012. And following these experiences in Argentina, I decided I wanted to do my IQP in a Spanish speaking country. So I chose Costa Rica. And in Costa Rica, my team worked with a sponsor that was involved with promoting and uh, working with sustainable fishing in Costa Rica and marine protected areas. Following my experiences in Costa Rica, I then traveled to Paraguay with Global Humanitarian Alliance, which was a club at WPI. And we got to meet with the Ministry of Health and work on a dengue fever prevention project. And this ultimately jump-started the Paraguay IQP site for future generations of WPI students. And it was really through my experiences studying abroad in Latin America, particularly in Costa Rica and in Paraguay, that really sparked my interest in public health. And I knew that after graduating WPI, I wanted to pursue my PhD in biology and do some sort of uh, biological research. But I really learned that I was more interested 
not just in the basic science, but also in the translation of my research into something more important to help um, those around the world. And so that led me to apply for my PhD at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, where I worked in tropical medicine. I did my PhD in malaria diagnostics. And so I did have a basic science project, but I was able to see how the impacts or what the impacts my research was gonna have on people in countries all over the world, including in Latin America, Africa, and in Asia. After my PhD, I decided to pursue patent law, and I now work as a technology specialist in a law firm in Boston doing life science patent law. And this really allows me to pursue both my passions of biology and the humanities, because not only do I need to understand and analyze cutting edge, complicated life science technologies, but I also have to be able to write about them and communicate about them to others. And so this allows me to really use what I learned during my experiences at WPI as a biology and Spanish double major. Okay, great. Um, well, um, yeah, those student testimonials are, are really pretty awesome, right? Not students, I guess, recent alumni um, are really fantastic. And I think demonstrate how we're making, in, you know, increasing efforts to kind of integrate uh, students, different pieces, different pieces of student experiences related to Latin American and Caribbean studies together as they kind of move through WPI and also think about their careers uh, after WPI. So, um, Following uh, uh, them, we have some other, another group of alumni uh, who graduated from WPI uh, a few years earlier um, than those that you have just seen. But what brings them to us is that they all uh, work in uh, industry and uh, all, are all from uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, right? Uh, so alumni that can you know, give us a really good sense of another way that WPI uh, interacts with the region um, you know, in, in an everyday uh, way and in a longstanding way as well. Um, so our discussion today is going to be built around uh, sort of the economic impacts of COVID-19 in the region um, and thinking about obviously the very recent past, the present and, and also the future in sort of the near to medium term uh, and how, uh, you know, sort of the, the pandemic has affected in particular the economy uh, in the region um, in addition to some social issues as well that may be related, right, to economic uh, and health issues. Um, so we have, uh, you know, a set of panelists uh, from a diverse set of countries who are engaged in a number of different industries within the region, uh, who I think can demonstrate some commonalities and some differences and some critical and give us some critical insights on the crisis and how it is affecting economies, markets, uh, communities, uh, and those uh, and those sorts of things. One of the interesting things that, that came out of the preparations that we made uh, just sort of in meeting, you know, sort of as a group a couple weeks ago was that there's definitely some extreme difficulties, right, uh, that are worth highlighting associated with the crisis, but it's not without its opportunities. And I think that's something that's been really interesting, you know, in other areas, right, of, of science and technology, but also, um, you know, sort of other, other ways that, you know, sort of um, opportunities can stem from uh, periods of crisis. And I hope that comes out today uh, to some degree uh, as well. <clears throat> um, so uh, joining us today, as you see on the list here on the slide, uh, is our uh, Leila Carvajal Erker, who's the CEO of Cocoa Supply, uh, which is based in Ecuador. Uh, it's a company that brings sustainable cocoa products and chocolate uh, to international markets uh, from Ecuador. Uh, also join us, joining us is Hernando Carvajal, uh, who's a managing director at uh, BMW Group uh, in Latin America. He's based in Mexico, uh, but he is uh, originally from Colombia um, and uh, a graduate of WPI, obviously, as all of our uh, panelists are. Uh, we also have Fernando Mota, uh, who is the CEO and general manager of Felipe Mota, uh, which is uh, sort of a luxury goods, wine distribution, wholesaler and retailer in Panama. Uh, and finally, uh, Carlos um, Zucolijo, who is an executive director of uh, FAPSISA, uh, which uh, is in Paraguay and is a distributor of light machinery and industrial equipment. Um, so I hope you can see how we have, uh, as I was indicating, kind of a pretty diverse uh, panel here in terms of the region and also the types of, of economies and markets and industries uh, into, in which they're, they're involved. Uh, so if you could just go to the next slide, please. So I just thought really, really briefly uh, to start out with one slide on the impact that COVID has had in the region from a health perspective, just to, to provide a little bit of, of, of background. 
Um, I don't think it's an exaggeration to you know, think of the region as among the most hardest hit from a global perspective uh, by COVID. Um, uh, you know, obviously maybe alongside North America and Europe, um, uh, it's been, um, you know, the effects uh, have been uh, extreme. Uh, many, most of you probably have heard about uh, the degree to which Brazil has been affected by uh, COVID uh, and uh, has the third highest um, recorded uh, uh, cases uh, uh, in the world after uh, the United States and India, uh, over 6 million uh, as of today and uh, about 175,000 deaths as well in Brazil. Um, but it, it goes much beyond that, right? Our Argentina, Colombia, uh, Mexico, um, some of the larger countries, uh, you know, outside of Brazil in the region, all with over a million cases, uh, Mexico with over 100,000 deaths. And those are the recorded cases, right? The reported cases. We have to remember that there could be non-reported cases that are, that are um, you know, not in sort of the, the official World Health Organization data. Um, I think beyond those bigger numbers, the, the cases per capita in the region have also been really critical in a number of different places, in the Andes, in Central America, um, places where the populations are not quite as high, but the incidence rate per capita has been really significant. Um, and obviously this has translated in very important ways to um, economic output, changes in economic output, negative growth, um, and a restructuring of, of economies, uh, both on the macro level and the micro level, right? We have to think of these economies being affected um, from a national standpoint, uh, but also, you know, due to the in integration uh, of, uh, you know, Latin American economies in global markets, uh, as every other place is, they are entirely dependent on, um, you know, the ebbs and flows of, of, of global industry and, and global commodities prices and, and exports and imports and those kinds of things. So it's hard to isolate in some ways the two, uh, domestic and international. Um, but the bottom line is that the economic downturns in other parts of the world have certainly also affected um, Latin America and the Caribbean in, in significant ways. Um, the latest data from the, the IMF, the, the October World Economic uh, Outlook, uh, was for a greater than 8% decline in GDP. Uh, that's for the region. Um, uh, and, um, you know, Mexico, I think, was about 9%, Brazil, about 6%. These are all negative uh, growth numbers for, for 2020. You know, slight growth, uh, maybe a bit of a recovery um, uh, uh, next year, but from a very, very much lower base, right? And I think, um, uh, you know, that may be optimistic even, right, um, given uh, sort of the situation that's happening in a number of places and a number of the major economies and smaller economies uh, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. So just to give you kind of a, a, a brief outline of uh, sort of where things sit um, health-wise and, and economy-wise from a very sort of top-down sort of perspective. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is to just uh, invite the panelists uh, to, to join us. And if we could stop uh, sharing the, um, okay, great, uh, the slides, uh, we can uh, um, welcome again our, our panelists. Uh, thank you very much for for joining us, it's been uh, a true pleasure um, just interacting with you and and um, developing uh, sort of the the topics for discussion today. So I'm going to ask each of the panelists a question uh, and to foster some discussion sort of along these lines um, uh, in, in relation to sort of economics and social issues and 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 maybe the path forward, right? Um, as as difficult as that may be to to determine at this time. So I'll start with Fernando, and um, I'm wondering if maybe you could just, you know, sort of start us off with a discussion about uh, maybe some of the principal economic consequences, um, you know, just sort of, uh, you know, a good place for us to start is to, to think about what, what are the major economic issues that, that the crisis that have, emer has emer have emerged sort of from the crisis, you know, over the last eight, nine months. So. Uh, thank you, John, for the question. It's really an honor and a privilege to do this panel with my and my fellow alumni. Uh, to answer the question, I must first note that pre-COVID, Latin America as a region was already lagging behind in terms of social development, mm -hmm. and it was going through its slowest periods of growth in, in decades. Right. Uh, then COVID hit, and as John just mentioned, it has hit Latin America harder than any other part of the world. The, the region has 8% of the population and about a third per, percent, uh, about a third of the COVID deaths in the world. And eight of the top 15 countries in terms of debt per capita for COVID are in Latin America. 
Uh, so the region is also experiencing one of the biggest contractions among developing uh, economies with most GDP estimates that I've seen for the region predicting, as Sean said, eight to 9% contraction. So, so almost for sure, reduced revenues and increased debt will make it harder for governments to run social programs to protect the most vulnerable sectors, which of course have been the most affected uh, uh, for, from COVID. Mm -hmm. So to answer the question for me, Increased unemployment, increased poverty, increased inequality, are the, and a real risk of social unrest will be the principal consequence of COVID in Latin America, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah, and your mention of debt, I think, is interesting. And I don't know if other folks want to, you know, sort of comment on this as well. But, you know, that usually debt is, you know, not, it's an immediate concern, but it's also sort of a medium term issue. Right. Um, in significant ways. And it's worth thinking about, you know, how, you know, let's say we have a vaccine, let's say, um, you know, things are, are moving forward, um, you know, sort of in the middle part of, of 2021, uh, to some degree in terms of the implementation of, of, of um, you know, where the vaccine is really having an impact, right, on the incidence of the virus. Um, you know, that debt issue is going to be really critical, it seems to me. Um, and and I, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on, on that. Well, for sure, it's 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 a loss that a lot of people have experienced, and and nothing can really compensate that. And mm -hmm. and even even if the vaccine comes and things go back to normal, you will always have that loss to 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 bear with. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, I'll just move on to, to Leila and, and sort of a question about um, maybe what you think perhaps some of the, the policy responses that have come, um, maybe economic, but also uh, potentially health-wise or socially and that sort of thing um, that you maybe think have been introduced uh, in Latin America, maybe Ecuador more specifically based on your own experience, um, but also because, you know, I know that your business, um, you know, you're based in New York, we also have operations in, in the Netherlands and that sort of thing. So you've been, you know, probably more than most of us moving around a little bit uh, over the last six to eight months. Uh, and I sort of wonder, you know, what you maybe have noticed about, um, you know, sort of the responses in Latin America or Ecuador specifically relative to maybe some of the other places that you've, that you've visited or, or other, other things that you've kind of experienced um, in one place or the other. Sure, thank you so much for having me. And yes, of course, in Ecuador, we saw probably the first case already end of February. So we were one of the first countries that was the virus and it was one of the hardest hit. The immediate response, of course, was different than the ones that saw it already coming from being aware that it was, for example, in Salvador, knew about it, didn't have a case, and already did a stay at home or lockdown. Yeah. Um, we did the response, uh, which was basically locking up everything. We had uh, mm -hmm. very strict curfews. We had restrictions of mobilization with license plates. Um, it was uh, for two months pretty dire. It, mm -hmm. Basically, the industry shut down. Um, later on, there were like, added uh, like April. April. Yes, we're talking mid-March to yeah. beginning of April, even mid-April we had. Then slowly they started to help the industry that was most relevant, not only essential workers in the sense of uh, health, but also the exports, which is the main income, like besides oil, the main income of, of the country. So they started to give uh, those passes to that industry to allow them to continue at least to a minimal base or the basics. Uh, it was complicated because uh, the mobilization, especially Guayaquil, was, which was is the main exporting port, was difficult. Uh, there were car restrictions by license plate and so on. So the industry had to become very creative in hiring different type of different cars with different license plates to move over. But that was just the response to to help the spread of the virus, which was one of the responses of the government. Of course, then there came different type of responses. Uh, one of them was just more on the basic level of making sure that utilities were not cut off or making sure that there was a little stimulus of $60 for families that had under $400 uh, per month. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there were also then some larger implications. One was the, well, they did some deferral of taxes. They also used some mm -hmm. tax is um, increase in taxes. So that was more the political part as an opportunity, I would say, even. 
Um, but then we also had another part, which was interesting that we started to focus also on the small business aspect of how important the local businesses were, the smaller ones, not just the export industry, but also the smaller because e-commerce, which was in Ecuador actually underdeveloped compared to other countries, mm -hmm. started to increase. And this brought up, and that's probably the opportunity that I see is brought up some, some uh, value of having smaller companies that did deliveries that did uh, uh, and they also received some funding from the government too um, so generally the the response I think in Latin America was very driven also driven also on the popularity of, of the government of what they wanted to project so we have two uh, sides we have one that were very strict with lockdowns and very uh, how you say it, uh, protector. And the other ones that were basically ignoring any scientific facts or trying to ignore the, 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 the problem or trying to just say, well, we have to deal with it. We'll just continue the way it is. It's not as important. We have other things, as Hernan already said, we were already not in a good situation. We can just not make it worse by. So you have really a very diverse uh, response, even though, uh, Politically, some opponents that were one very conservative, one very leftist, they somehow have the same response, which is also very interesting. I think it has more to do with the popularity of the government. Right. Compared to what was interesting for me is compared to New York, which had the same timing as Guayaquil, which is my city, both of them had the virus early on. So both of them came and had probably one of the strongest lockdown uh, reactions uh -huh. based on the fact that they didn't know what they're dealing with. Right. Suddenly they had a death rate that was increasing every day. There were no treatments known yet for this virus. There was even not even exactly known how it is spread. So yeah. I think that uh, that similarity we can see, uh, the difference a little bit on that Ecuador after shortly after also decided not to go with the essential workers just as health but also as the export, which was a revenue in, uh, 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 stream. New York was more trying to force it into essential workers and logistics and everything was still open. So anything that's yeah. US was still, the, they were considered part of the essential workers. Yeah. But, um, and th there was a similarity also in a stimulus, a small stimulus to mm -hmm. for the population. What I saw interestingly in Europe is that they were trying to protect the labor force by giving even up to in the case of Netherlands up to ninety percent of the of the salaries of the of the employers of the employees to right. the employers for a certain amount of time if they can prove that they have been hit. In the case of, of Ecuador, the labor the labor law actually, which is normally very strong, was actually uh, loose now. So they were able to decrease salaries. They were able to shorten hours. They were able to find uh, uh, to have some cuts without all the regular implications of benefits and so on. Mm -hmm. So we see that's also a difference between what one country is trying to achieve with the other one. Mm -hmm. Generally, seeing we will still, I mean, we're still in the middle of it. So the implication is still long term. So we also talked a lot about the informal workforce. Which is very high in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. They, of course, had uh, they had to go out. It was not for most of them, even though it was just even making their their uh, everyday earning harder because mobility was more expensive or more complicated. So we're still in the middle of trying to find out what really the the the, the outcome is going to be. Um, so that's the bad part, and the good part is I do think that some smaller businesses or some local businesses will mm -hmm. have found uh, a, finally the value within their community and society that they can actually bloom or have a push from not only government but also from the locals that are supporting them right yeah okay fair enough yeah i mean i think there's there's been a, a an education a big learning curve i mean you mentioned it in terms of you know just understanding how the virus is transmitted and you know mm -hmm. like the early days you know there's very very little in the case of, of what to do so it was just locked down right and obviously the economic implications of that were massive right and very quick uh -huh. uh, and so it kind of ties into a little bit of what Fernando is talking about 
Um, and I think, you know, I don't know, what, it, what is your experience for, for any of any of the panelists, you know, in terms of this question of, you know, sort of limiting mobility, limiting, uh, you know, sort of certain types of economic activity versus obviously undermining, right, additional economic productivity that could potentially come from any sort of reopening, right? I mean, this is, um, has there been a, an, uh, a learning experience that has caused any significant change in, in the way that governments are approaching uh, economic policy, you know, during the virus, during the pandemic? Well, the, the lesson here in Panama has been that lockdowns alone don't work. You have to couple them with education, with testing, with tracing. Otherwise, just stay at home doesn't doesn't work uh, as a, as, a, as a measure to control uh, the pandemic. Right, I see. That's that's the difficult questions for governments. I mean, I don't want to put myself in their shoes at this point in time because it's a no-win game uh, at the end of the day. Right. Uh, and we did see different approaches in different countries. And for example, in Mexico, it was the other way around. Uh, given the enormous amount of informal economy that goes on here, well, shutting down is pretty much not an option. Right. So at the beginning, when all this started, and Laila highlighted how Ecuador reacted really fast, some other countries in Latin America imposed very tough curfews very early on. It was not the case in Mexico. And then, but the problem is that the, the health situation starts deteriorating at such mm -hmm. pace. Mm -hmm. And uh, some, uh, I mean, Mexico City, uh, more than 25 million people live in, in one place. It's clear that this is going to start spreading out of control. Healthcare system is not built for that. Uh, and the uh, government didn't have the response required. Mm -hmm. So you end up having a very critical health situation. Mm -hmm. And then the shutdown measures come. And like Fernando just mentioned, it's, well, people cannot just stay at home waiting for things to, uh, to improve. So it's a very difficult situation. You have people that live on a day-to-day -day means basis and they have to go out, they have to find uh, work because otherwise they're not gonna be eating that, that week. So mm -hmm. it's a very difficult situation to control in Latin America for that reason. And this is probably one of the main reasons why this is gonna stick with us for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Why this economic uh, situation is gonna be tough for the region in much longer than for other more developed uh, countries. Yeah, and I like the point also that Fernando makes about, you know, like it was very similar in Argentina where there was a, you know, it hit late but, and they locked down very early. Um, and so the assumption was that, you know, there was going to be some ability to create a buffer, right? Um, and, and nevertheless, right, it hit later and the lockdown was even longer than maybe in other places because it, they started before it even, right, has significant incidents in the country. And so the economic impacts in Argentina have been absolutely horrendous as you know other places and you know it does really bring up an interesting kind of question about what does a lockdown so if the lockdown doesn't w work then what do you do because um you know if if it's going if there is potential for incidents to increases increase regardless then the lockdown then a full-on stay-at-home order right may not be the best answer but then what is right uh in terms of kind of balancing you know sort of public health and economics right. at the end of the day they uh some of the things that they've tried to do is to establish how critical is the business to uh, uh daily life and to the economy and to try to impose different sets of rules for different businesses right. uh so if it's not so critical and you can do it uh, uh, at home, then offices are shut, mandatorily shut. Mm -hmm. And if the business uh, has to absolutely get together, then they have special permits. Right. Uh, but then again, it's a halfway solution and uh, mm -hmm. still with its challenges. Right, That's yeah. a little bit what Ecuador tried to do with the salvoconductos, with the passes. It was based on industry. It was based on um, how important it was. It was a learning process. It was not something that they established from the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was after months of lockdown, they realized we need to get exports out. We need to. And it is also, I, I see Fernando Neil that when that it is a mix of things that we need to establish. It's not just saying either lockdown or that one, it's testing, it's uh, new treatments that came along, even though they were not really cured itself, but we knew later on a little bit how to treat this virus, how it's, and that also helped with, as at the beginning, 
It was just the main panic. We have this virus. It was already in Ecuador. We had dead people on the street. We were really like in the news because of that and what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I think there's really not a right answer. I agree with, uh, with Orlando, the balance between uh, the health, the public health and the economy, and both of them affect each other. So in, we don't have a safety net like Europe that's, uh, first of all, hospitals are we're well more prepared. And, and, and generally there is even a, 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 a health insurance and so on, which we lack for. So mm -hmm. definitely some difficult questions and not really one answer. Yeah. Yeah, I want to jump off that point about um, adaptation and, and, and change and, and think a little bit about, and even the balancing act, right? Mm -hmm. um, and ask a question to Carlos about, um, you know, maybe how not just governments, but how maybe businesses or communities have kind of tried to adapt, right? So it's not just policy that has to kind of strike this balance. It's also individual businesses. It's also particular communities, right? And that sort of thing. So um, you know, in Paraguay or in the region more broadly, um, you know, based on your experience, how have you noticed that, you know, working habits have changed? I mean, Leila's mentioning like people getting multiple license plates, but, um, you know, sort of other maybe adaptations that may have occurred, uh, you know, within particular businesses to try and sort of manage this crisis, right, uh, in a domestic sense and even maybe, um, you know, sort of a, if there, if it is an international business in an international sense. Well, Paraguay is mainly uh, off the radar of many people. We're not one of those. We're not New York City or Rome where everyone flies into. So right. we didn't get that, that many foreigners coming in and out of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, that helped us at the beginning. And since Paraguay was maybe the first country or just about in Latin America to close down, then we were able to, to, get, uh, to stay for several months in the, on the safe side. Mm -hmm. Up till the end of July, we had less than 20 deaths <laughs> altogether in the country. So people, when the government started uh, uh, demanding people to stay home, uh, closing uh, offices, installing a curfew, which was on for more than two months from 8 p.m. till five in the morning, mm -hmm. people stayed home, watched TV, and they actually saw what was going on throughout the world. Mm -hmm. That helped them a lot to just you know, calm down and stay, mm -hmm. stay home to see what happens. Yeah. We were fortunate enough to uh, not need as much medical uh, uh, supplies as other countries. So when everyone in the world was fighting over the, the, the shortage of medical supplies, we still didn't need them. So that helped us a lot also. Right. On the other side, uh, when Paraguay closed down, that meant that all non-essential businesses had to close down. Schools, mm -hmm. everything were closed. Mm -hmm. But they opened a small, a small door, which was supposed to be for essential businesses, mm -hmm. including all kinds of foods, distribution, distributing. They left construction open. Mm -hmm. So that left lots of, of businesses working. Uh, they did install mandatory hand washing kits outside of every single uh, public uh, space, which is still on today. You cannot walk into a pharmacy or you cannot walk into a supermarket without washing your, heads, your hands, getting alcohol put on your hands, and then someone taking your temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, shopping malls were closed for three, three full months. Mm -hmm. So that, that really made it complicated, but people were so uh, worried about what was going on in other places that, that they held on. Now the government started giving out aid right at the beginning. Two weeks into the, the, the closing, the government was already announcing salaries distributed to all people who were, whose businesses were closed, Right. All workers and workers who were, who had uh, what we call here informal jobs, okay, who are not registered, they just got a plain aid. I mean, they went they, they went to the, the police station. They got a, a certificate that said that they worked as a plumber, carpenter, whatever, mm -hmm. and they actually got half a salary from the government that month, right. and every month from on. So that helped the economy to withstand. Now, Paraguay had a very very low foreign debt. So it was very easy for Paraguay to contract more debt. That helped a lot. Right. Now, uh, businesses had really, they've had to completely change, to readapt. Uh, restaurants are still maybe at the most 40% open, mm -hmm. but most restaurants within a month were already working on sending delivery of even good uh, international uh, platers 
to, to, their, to homes. So waiters became taxi drivers or uh, uh, motorcycle drivers taking food to homes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, teleworking grew a lot. Fortunately, what happened, what happened this pandemic uh, started when internet was working pretty well. Imagine what would have happened 40 years before. And actually, there was no ways of, to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone in the today, many banks and many public offices, people are still turning, taking turns working. So you only have like 30, 70% uh, uh, of the people at the office in shifts, just in case someone has a problem that that whole shift stays at home. Uh, they ran a survey uh, a month ago, and it turned out that 85% of the survey population switched from buying whatever they used to buy before foreign to buying local options if they were available. Mm -hmm. So that really helped the local industry a lot in local production. Mm -hmm. People were buying in the streets fruit from local street vendors. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever you had two choices of whatever, people chose locally. Mm -hmm. They said, I gotta help my fellow countrymen or not uh, citizen, people live in the country. And that really helped a lot. The country uh, was able to you know, pull itself together and keep on going. Now, our problem is that we're landlocked. Our neighbors are amongst the countries with the largest problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And our borders are very, very unprotected. I mean, everyone, anyone can cross our borders by either water, forest, or a regular pasture and come to, our, to Paraguay or leave Paraguay. So by the end of July, when the government started to open up, and allow more uh, social gatherings and things like that, then the, the rate of infections grew sharply. Right. So with, only within the month, the first two weeks of the month of August, we, have, we had more cases of infected people than since the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right now we're up to about 80,000, which is close to 1% of the population who've been infected. Three quarters of them are cured by now. We're up to about 1,800 who passed away, that's about 240 in every 100,000. But uh, the people have really gone, what I call back to basics. I mean, they do a lot of, they do a lot less traveling far away. At the beginning, you couldn't even travel outside of the city. Now you can travel anywhere you want in the country. There are no more restrictions, but people choose not to go too far away. <laughs> uh, people spend a lot more time in the family with a very small group of close friends. And uh, you know, they're just concentrating on their closer net, mm -hmm. family, close friends and work, that's it. Yeah, I like this notion of, of learning processes that you mentioned. So it's not just that you know, health professionals are learning from other places or uh, you know, governments are learning from you know, looking at what you know, other hard hit countries have done but also individuals, right? They see the news, they see um, how human behavior, group behavior, those sorts of things have you know, impacted one thing or the other. And so there's kind of this transfer of knowledge, um, you know, in Paraguay's case, you know, because it hit later, then there is a transfer of knowledge and some experience, right? Maybe drawn from other countries that were hit previously in, a, in sort of a social, from a social perspective and from a business perspective, right, as well. Um, we there are a couple of uh, unique things that happened here. We had hospitals closing down due to the lack of patients. Mm -hmm. Because with people staying home, kids not going to, to school anymore, everyone eating at home as compared to eating out in the streets. Mm -hmm. Kids were not getting sick. I have friends who are pediatricians who are just about out of work. Right. They haven't had any patients to try because kids don't get sick anymore. And if they do get sick, Parents do their best not to take them to the, the, the pediatrician or the hospital. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I you know that's been I know that that's been the case in the U.S. and some in some places. Primary care uh, facilities have actually suffered a little bit, um, you know, in terms of their businesses, um, you know, uh, um, over the last um, you know since the since the beginning of the crisis. Um, we don't have a ton more time, but I did want to sort of, um, you know, think about, um, you know, sort of forward looking things and, and implications and that sort of thing. So, uh, Hernando, I, I wanted to sort of see if, if maybe you could provide some thoughts on, on you know, um, I think, you know, social, we've been talking a lot about kind of social behavior, social, social implications and those kinds of things, you know, as a result of the health and economic crisis. But I'm also sort of wondering, 
you know, how can we think about this as, you know, potentially an opportunity um, uh, to, you know, in a forward looking way, you know, in the near to even medium term, right, um, learn from this crisis, right, and, and maybe continue uh, in, in a new normal, right, um, and not back to the old. Like what, when the new normal comes. Right, like what's so, <laughs> when like, that is. Five years or whatever it is, yeah. right, whenever we, where we declare that there's a new normal, uh, you know, what, what will be new about the normal, I guess, you know, potentially, or what's, what's valuable about a new normal? Um, I think uh, this, uh, this situation has forced everyone to change one way or another. Mm -hmm. So we had to adapt. We had to learn how to work uh, remotely for the most part. Uh, so the people that could do it are working remotely and it has definitely opened up new opportunities mm -hmm. and it has definitely opened up new ways of working. So that I believe will continue and it will drive us forward. Mm -hmm. um, the other part, and then uh, Carlos mentioned this, we did see a lot of uh, support within the community for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this was pretty much across the board. Mm -hmm. um, it, it manifested itself in different ways, but I think that also will help um, in the future to continue with this sort of social behavior, mm -hmm. uh, that it's not so um, selfish anymore, but it's going to be a little bit more towards the community. Those are the positive things that I can see coming out of this mm -hmm. that will endure, hopefully. Uh, for sure, the way we interact, the way we work will change. Mm -hmm. um, I used to, uh, and, and we've discussed this before, but I used to travel massively and that will definitely change. Mm -hmm. um, people will no longer be traveling so much for business. Mm -hmm. um, all these uh, virtual environments have definitely blossomed and uh, are here to stay. Uh, whether the office environments and uh, gathering environments will be the same, it's also up for grabs. I think mm -hmm. that will be a permanent change into the future because suddenly businesses figured out that uh, we can keep on working from home. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not ideal, uh, but a, a hybrid of how we work today or nowadays and how we used to work mm -hmm. is going to stay with us. So it will change the way we interact. It will change the way we uh, uh, deal with the day-to-day -day business. Um, but I do see a lot of positives that will come out of this and we will for sure have some negative consequences, but we need to start, uh, I mean, we've had a tough year behind us, uh, almost a year now. Uh, it will be tough for a while. So we uh, better start thinking positive and thinking how we uh, can, uh, take advantage of the positive things that this uh, situation has left us. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I do believe that there are some very positive things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to think that like we're socially distanced, right? But like you're suggesting that it's actually brought us but certain communities closer. So, uh, you know, it's just quite interesting to sort of think. Yeah. It. So closer, it's but... reconnected a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. And I think a BMW is a good example where you have like, you know, you have the executives, but then you have you know, maybe sales, which could transition to some degree, but obviously you have manufacturing, which, you know, it's hard to see that changing, right? In terms of, um, you know, sort of people needing to be, right, at the manufacturing center uh, and that sort of thing, right? Um, from, from that perspective, the manufacturing will have to continue. Yeah. Uh, but on the other side, I mean, we used to have uh, uh, very large workshops, worldwide workshops, so get together in uh, Germany and it was all the markets in the world are there. Uh, needless to say, this year it hasn't happened, mm -hmm. and we have done them all virtually. Now it's very difficult to do this virtually with uh, the Asian time zones and the American time zones uh, converging at the same time. Mm -hmm. So that is difficult to happen, but it has worked. And we have had uh, workshops with more than 300 people at the same time with interaction, the right. technology is there. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it has taught us that we can do it. And uh, uh, on, you mentioned sales on the sales. You also have a lot of this personal relationship basis mm -hmm. that I do believe you need to continue to have. It's important to have. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important that we don't lose all physical connection. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, the social physical connection is important to have as well, mm -hmm. uh, but it will definitely change. Mm -hmm. It will definitely have a different connotation in the future. Right. And it is nice that we can get somebody from, from Panama, from New York slash Ecuador, uh, mm -hmm. from Asuncion and from Mexico City 
uh, in Worcester, right? Uh, in, in one phone call, not to mention, you know, all the other participants today. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think we've uh, we've done a really good job. I think of, of of addressing a number of these issues, not just from an economic perspective, which is obviously important, but how economics is a social science, right? It's about people and communities and, and societies and that sort of thing. So it's about social welfare as well. Um, so thank you very much for your participation today. Um, it's really been a fantastic over afternoon overall. Um, you know, showcasing, I think, the global school to some degree, but also Latin American and Caribbean studies at WPI in really important ways. And I thank you for, for contributing to that. Um, I think we've been able to see how, you know, sort of research and discovery and technological development can be a part of what WPI is doing in terms of the global school and Latin American and Caribbean studies. Um, you know, we've seen student project work, we've seen um, uh, faculty and institutional engagement research, um, you know, the ability to connect these different pieces of, uh, of um, you know, WPI's engagement with Latin, Latin American and Caribbean studies in, in really, really important ways. Um, so I just wanna say thank you to everybody that participated. I wanna say thank you to uh, uh, Rachel Roy uh, uh, and others for helping us to organize this event. I wanna say thank you to um, our uh, alumni panelists again uh, for, their, for their excellent participation. It's been a really great experience interacting with you all uh, over the last month or two as we've been planning this. Uh, I wanna thank our faculty project center directors uh, for a really interesting panel um, demonstrating how you know, WPI uh, misses uh, to some degree, but uh, will soon have, uh, you know, sort of student boots on the ground, as it were, um, you know, making some of those bottom up connections and, and, and building um, uh, from those from those institutional connections uh, from the bottom up. Um, I want to thank Paul Matheson and Wole for their uh, discussions of, of sustainable uh, uh, sustainability plan. Uh, and, and to Wole for introducing uh, uh, the, this afternoon uh, in such an eloquent way. And finally, to Carlos Nobri, especially for his thoughts on the risks and opportunities of uh, development in the Amazon. Um, so all that in, in you know, a matter of a few hours was really, really, I think, an exceptional demonstration of, of what w, WPI can do and how it can interact with Latin America and the Caribbean in really interesting ways. Um, so just finishing up, a quick reminder that we have uh, our, our Global School Virtual Event Series continues uh, after the new year. Uh, in January, there's going to be uh, a, uh, a, a, an event similar to this on the Middle East uh, and the Oceania uh, group uh, will be um, uh, up on, on February 9th um, as well. So um, thanks everyone. Uh, and uh, we'll see you uh, in January. Take care. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John.